Inshallah, we'll start with some uh, recitation from Al-Quran Kareem <coughs> to start our day. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahi Rahmani Rahim وَإِذْ قَالَ لُقْمَانُ لِبْنِهِ وَهُوَ يَعِظُهُ يَا بُنَيَّ لَا تُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ إِنَّ الشِّرْكَ لَظُلْمٌ عَظِيمٌ وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتْهُ أُمُّهُ وَهْنًا عَلَى وَهْنٍ وَفِصَالُهُ فِي عَامَيْنٍ أَنِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكَ إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ عَلَىٰ أَن تُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٌ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفًا واتبع سبيل من أناب إلي ثم إلي مرجعكم فأنبئكم بما كنتم تعملون سبحانك اللهم بحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم um, inshallah, we'll start shortly. I actually recited from Surah Luqman, and um, Alhamdulillah, it's a beautiful surah about a someone who's not a prophet, not a messenger, yet he made it to the Quran, and a surah got named after him, and the gist of his story in the Quran, almost the totality of it, is him talking to his son. So how do you talk to your son? And what are your priorities? And how can you benefit from the story of Luqman, Surah Luqman, you know? Uh, so, inshallah, I thought that is a good way to start our recitation. And Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the translation of what I said and mention when Luqman said to his son, O oh my dear son, the word Ya Bunayya, La uh, tushrik billah, do not associate partners with Allah. Inna shirk ala dhulmun azim, truly shirk is great oppression. This is a very big statement that takes a whole day to explain that when Vulm, great oppression to who? To yourself, to your family, to your community, to your neighbors, to the society, to humanity, to planet Earth. Because if Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful, is not the God that you worship and the only one, then the world will go into chaosness and oppression will spread as we see today happening in the world people make claims okay we human beings sit down we agree there is international law there is human rights there is civil rights this is, and then the leader before the follower breaks the rules and it becomes uh, the law of the jungle and might is right and so what's going to stop the human from doing that? If the human wants to do that and they have the power, he or she or they or them, they all have this power, whatever country we're talking about, if they want it, nothing is going to stop them except if the person has enough faith in them to know, I am not God, I cannot act like that, we all together with our power, we're not God, let's not 
And, 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 and it's very interesting that when the human thinks that he's God, the first thing that he does is oppression. If you want to be like God, be merciful. <laughs> Pharaoh said, uh, I can't find for you any other God than me. But then Pharaoh found out, obviously he knows that the, the Egyptians worship multiple gods. So they, they said, okay, you're a God on earth, but then there is a moon, the God in heaven, the one God, the big one. So Pharaoh got so bothered, he said, okay, I don't want to be just a God, I want to be the God. So he gave himself a promotion from a God to Qala ana rabbukum al-a'la. I'm the highest Lord and God that you have. <laughs> he gave himself a promotion. It's not good enough to be a God. طيب, Mr. Rabbukum al-a'la, falsely, uh, what are you going to do? Kill the children. What is this? Kill the children. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows children to be born and grow to become adults. And your idea of be becoming a God is to kill, destroy, right? So even when people claim that they're God, they're not even trying to be like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know? So the world is getting nothing out of it except oppression. So and this statement makes you understand Islam. Even today's topic, what are we learning? Why Allah is teaching us in the Quran and through the example of the Prophet وسلم, parenting. Why? So that we benefit. So when you do shirk, do you oppress Allah? No. Who do you oppress? Yourself, your family, your community, humanity, and the planet. Uh, when, you, when you submit to the will of Allah and follow the laws that make sense to every human, do not kill, do not steal, do not cheat, do not lie, do not do this, do not, and, and do this and do that and be kind and give charity. And If you follow, the world will be a better place. Today will be a better place. We don't even have to wait till tomorrow. So the idea here is, this is very important, and this is the translation of the first. It's like a crash course in Islamic ideology and Islamic understanding the big picture. Why la ilaha illallah? Why do we worship just one God? So we don't end up oppressing ourselves and others. And so that we end up benefiting ourselves and others. So, and that's the big picture of Islam. Bring benefit, prevent harm from happening. If harm could not be prevented, treat it. Once you treat it, you recover. So always in Islam there is prevention, treatment, recovery. Prevention, don't do it. Treatment, make it your tawbah. Huh? And, and, and fix, stop doing it right now. Since you ended up doing what's haram or what's wrong, stop doing it. Recovery, establish a new relationship with Allah and follow a bad deed with a good one. That's the recovery system in Islam. It's move forward, move forward. Shaitan will always make you stuck in the past. You're bad because you did this and you did that in the past. And Allah wants you to replace a bad deed with a good one. Always forward-looking, forward-looking. Do something good today, and it will erase yesterday. So don't look in the past. Repent from the past. Stop doing what you're doing wrong, and move forward by doing a good deed, following a bad deed with a good one. So alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, that this is the translation of the first ayah. And then the ayat continues, but we're going to use them today uh, anyway, inshallah. Uh, I want to start today with the last two uh, big picture uh, so that then we can dive into the details. Two <coughs> big pictures that we need to complete and mindsets. That when uh, basically, <coughs> like yesterday we talked how children are a blessing, you know, having children is a major blessing and it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, what I wanted to, uh, and then how Allah designed us in families uh, and made us nations and tribes, so races, different colors, different languages, that's Allah's plan for humanity. First is that there will be husband and wife. Second, that there will be children. Third, that there will be a family and an extended family. And the extended family is extensively mentioned in the Quran. خَالَاتِكُمْ عَمَّاتِكُمْ أَعْمَامِكُمْ أَخْوَالِكُمْ وَبَنَاتُ الْأَخِي وَبَنَاتُ الْأُخْتِ وَبَنَاتُ أَخْوَالِكُمْ 
يعني the extended family is mentioned one by one your aunts maternal aunts paternal aunts maternal uncles paternal uncles your your nephews your nieces your the, so allah mentions those extended family and considers it one of the widest doors to go to heaven and live a happy life in this world is to connect yourself with this family right so this is very important that's allah designed from the extended family became the tribe and from the tribe become the nation and the nations sometimes have different skin colors and different and and the difference in the skin color the allah's design the difference in the language in surah al rum after allah mentioned the family he mentioned humanity he created for you mates from amongst yourselves so that you will feel secure and and and, and sakina next to them and he put affection love wa rahma truly in that are signs for those who reflect the next ayah and one of allah's signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the variation of your tongues yani languages and skin colors so allah's design couple couple with children couple with children with extended family extended family tribe neighborhood so many teachings in islam about neighbors 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 because islam knows that your life you will see your neighbors more than you see your relatives so relatives are important but also neighborhood is important sayyidna rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said jibril kept on telling me your neighbor your neighbor the neighbor to the neighbor till i thought he's going to come to me and tell me the neighbor will inherit too and when you die your neighbor will be part of like the inheritance <laughs> that's لازال جبريل يوصيني بالجار حتى ظننت أنه سيورثه. This is hadith. So functioning on the level of the neighborhood, functioning on the level of the community, larger neighborhoods, society, and that's a whole, inshallah, presentation. Maybe one day we will learn how Islamic teachings differ. That there is completely different sets of teachings. Of you to practice Islam on the level of the individual, one set, another whole set of learning and teaching, which we're doing now on the level of the family, and then extended family, another whole different set of teachings about practicing Islam on the level of the neighborhood. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They asked him, "Who's al mu'min?" He said, "Man amina jarahu bawaiqa." The one who's his neighbor is secure from his, uh, uh, from his harm. You will not spy. You will not look through the window. You will not try to eavesdrop. You will not. You will not. Like, al mu'min is the one whose neighbor feels secure next to him, because the word mu'min means secure. Also, most people don't know. You know, Allah's name is al mu'min, the one who grants security. The believer is al mu'min because he believes in Allah. People feel secure next to him. That's who the believer is. The meaning of the word believer is the one who feels people feel secure. <clears throat> Another interpretation: What قالوا من المؤمن يا رسول الله قال من أمينه الناس على أموالهم وأعراضهم. The one that people trust him with their money and trust him with their family, then and they feel secure that they, if they give them their money or they trusted their family with them they'll do a good job they, they feel secure that meaning that you will not hurt them in their money or their family and you will take care of their money and their family that's the definition of the word believer so there is a whole other level how does a muslim practice islam on the level of the ummah has nothing to do with the level of the individual there's a whole other set of teachings in Islam, complete matrix of how a Muslim deals with the world, the rest of the umam, the, the ones who are not Muslims. Whole different sitting, right? And, and it's very impressive. You know, because parenting, cross, cross, a word used in the Quran for parenting, and the same word is used with, how, this word is used in the Quran, of how do you treat your parents the same word is used to how to treat non-Muslims. It's very interesting. So one of the words of how we should treat our parents is what is bir wa barram bi walidati. 
Isa alayhi salam said, I'm good to my mother when he spoke as an infant. Yahya, Allah praised him, وَبَرَّمْ بِوَالِدَيْهِ And he, is, he treats his... Birr is like when you have a child, like an ideal child treating their parents in an ideal way. That's birr, right? Look how this word, Allah used it, of how a Muslim should treat another non-Muslim if that non-Muslim did not fight you, did not kick you out of your home, did not harm you, stood with you, good neighbor, good person, you treat them in so much high level, almost like you treat your parents. لا ينهاكم الله عن الذين لم يقاتلوكم في الدين ولم يخرجوكم من دياركم أن تبروهم وتقسطوا إليهم. Allah does not forbid you in Islam because this notion came. Oh, we are we became because all of the Sahaba we are non-Muslims and they became Muslims, the companion of the Prophet. So they are, oh, we we don't have, we don't owe anything to our. Some people became extreme. So Allah revealed, no, 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 hold on. Allah does not forbid you that when there is non-believers around you that did not fight you, try to change your deen change your religion, fight you in the religion, nor they kicked you out of your home, that you treat them with birr and justice. Justice means you don't oppress them. Birr, that you are very, 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 very nice to them. Look, a whole different set of teaching for treating and living Islam on the level of society, especially for us, majority of the society are not Muslim. How do we treat them? There's a whole set of teaching. Like literally, it will take days to explain the commands, like it's taken us now two days and it should take more. So this is what I call, you know, practicing Islam on the level of the individual, family, extended family, neighborhood, society, humanity, and the planet. There's a whole different set of teachings in Islam, how you treat the trees and the animals and the birds and the fish and the whale. It's very beautiful. Seven levels of practicing Islam. Today we're dealing with number two. Okay? So now, Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, uh, I wanted to share with you that in the... Uh, yesterday we explained the difference between the purpose and the role uh, or the responsibility of the human. I don't want to... Uh, uh, basically, repeat that. Uh, yes, when Allah Azza wa Jal, today the, the 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 mindset, when Allah grants you a son or a daughter, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "I granted you an insan, either an Adam or a Hawa, either an Adam or Eve. I granted you. Now, what are you gonna do with them?" And we explained yesterday what did Allah do with Adam and Eve when he made them live in the garden, whether that garden was Jannatul Akhirah or a garden on earth. That's not an issue. Uh, but the idea here is, is it's very important to realize that what Allah gave you, how, how much Allah favored the human, Allah is giving you the human, the human. This baby is a human, insan. So, if you read how what Allah says he has done for the insan, it will blow your mind. So Allah in the Quran says, I've created the skies and the earth for the service of the insan. In Surah Luqman, again, أَلَمْ تَرَوْا أَنَّ اللَّهَ سَخْرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَأَسْبَغَ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعَمَهُ ظَاهِرَةً وَبَاطِنَةً can't you see that Allah has subdued to you what's in the skies and what's on earth? And he bestowed his blessings upon you inwardly and outwardly. Why am I saying this? Because sometimes when we get a child like you, especially when you start having many children, like you're not realizing what Allah has given you. It's the most valuable thing. Forget all the money Allah gave you in the world. Forget all the prettiness, if you are pretty or handsome. Forget all the popularity. Forget all of Allah's blessings. The biggest blessing that Allah has given you is He has given you an insan. 
and trusted you with an insan. This insan that Allah has given you, this human that he has given you, he has created for him the skies and the earth as a home. You know, I see sometimes we, we copy Allah without knowing, you know, especially your first child. You prepare the room, you paint the room, you buy the crib, baby shower, diapers, already ready, uh, sets of change of clothes, uh, towels, the, the soap and the shampoos, uh, getting ready and excited, you know. Usually that dies with the second and third and fourth and this, you know. By the sixth kid, you forget the kid in the hospital, you come on like, oh, we forgot our baby and that. let's go back and get the baby. I joke with the people, you know. But subhanAllah, the idea of this insan that Allah has given you, you make a room for him. That's what you can, your insan. What did Allah make for this insan? A whole universe. A whole universe. That he can see, look at the universe and say, wow, I see Allah through this universe. And Allah for this insan, for this insan, he has dedicated for him two servants. We call them mom and dad. So there was two servants dedicated to you, your mom and dad. Now you are two servants. Look how Allah designed us. The, the human comes, mom and dad immediately taking care of him. Especially the mother in the beginning, the pregnancy and the breastfeeding the first two years. And, and the dad is working and providing and paying the bills and, you know, being there and taking the mother to the doctor, to the hospital, to this, to that, taking the child to all of that, two servants. And then a whole earth, a whole planet. You know, in Surah Al-Baqarah, in the very beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, like in the uh, basically uh, first pages always have five ayat, second page, third page, fourth page, in the bottom, huwa alladhi khalaqa lakum ma fil ardi jami'a. It is he who created for you everything that exists on earth. Everything that exists on, for you. So this insan that you have, that Allah gave you, this baby, everything that exists on earth was created for him and you. And Allah says, I subdue to you what's in the skies and what's on earth. You know, my interpretation to that is that we will be able to leave earth and colonize other planets. That's what I understand from this ayah. As Allah said, I subdue to you what's in the skies and the earth. I do believe very soon, maybe in 100, 200, we will figure out how to go to another galaxy and how to use another planet and how to live somewhere else. Because every planet is al-ard, is ard, ard yani a planet that where you can live. So maybe I am wrong. This is like just me having good time with the Quran and allowing my imagination to, you know, sail that when Allah says, I've subdued to you, subjected to you, made subservient to you what's in the skies and what's on earth. Is Allah talking about the clouds? Maybe, I don't know. But Allah is saying skies. That I actually believe that we will end up making machines going from the first sky to the second sky to the third sky. Allahu A'lam. And maybe I'm wrong. But that's what Allah says. How do you interpret it? It's up to you. And as long as you say this is not Quran, it's not Sunnah, like I'm telling you, this is my personal reflection. As long as you say that, that's okay, because you're not contradicting Quran and Sunnah. So the idea here is, this baby, Allah created the skies and the earth for him. And this child, uh, so haven't you seen that Allah, this is in Surah Luqman, and then there is another, Allah created for you everything that is on earth, the vegetation. The viruses, the bacteria, the fungi. Do you know what they have found out right now? Like the trees are connected with each other through fungi. They share water, they share food. And you know the fungi is the UPS, is the what? Is the DHL for international viewers, for the post office, for the mailman. So the fungi connects two trees. And this tree says, I'm hungry. So the fungi send the letter, this tree is hungry. This tree will send food and minerals to the other tree. And on the way, it charges, it charges, it eats. The fungi eats and passes the, the food. So it gets paid and it feeds the other. Like exactly Amazon delivery, basically. The, the, the driver gets paid and you get your stuff, you know. And, and the one who says also benefits. And this tree will send something else to the other tree. This is actually science right now. So imagine Allah created all of that for the human. It's a very big statement. Everything that exists on earth was created for the human. 
I mean, if that doesn't make you feel special, I don't know what makes you feel special. It's mind-boggling, subhanAllah. So, um, also, the, and that's the human that you and I are trying to raise. Just, just so that you know this human, like, has value. That child that is between your hands has value. Big value. The biggest value, right? What did Allah Azza wa Jal uh, tell us also in the Quran? He told us that this, uh, you know, this Adam, who's our father, we will all in his back, in his loin, in the back. And while we was, are in his loin, Allah taught Adam the names of all the things. And Allah made the angels bow down to Adam. This newcomer, us, human species, the men and women, we were all in the back of Adam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before even teaching Adam and telling the malaika to make sujood to him, in the hadith, Allah wiped on the back of the loin of Adam and took all of his descendants and threw him, threw them in front of him. So he's like right now looking, and how did he throw them? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put wabison min nur bayna aynay, everyone. He put a, a light between the eyes of everyone, and Adam looked, he saw billions and billions of dots of light. And Rasulullah sallallahu says, Adam, when he was, he said, what is this? Who are these? What, what, what's going on? And Allah said, these are your children. So I tell people, when Allah created you, the first thing that Allah gave you is nur. Before you even, he created your soul. He saw that you are nur. There is nur between your eyes. And he showed your face to your father, Adam. And this, it's up to you to keep that light, that nur, that light, or to let go of it. But the, our beginning with Allah was a positive, honorable beginning. Nur between your eyes. And then Allah put us back all in the loin of Adam, and then he taught Adam the names of all the things. The second honor is he made the malaika sujood, make sujood to us. The third honor, before he created Adam, he told the malaika, I am going to create Adam. And I'm going to, this whole universe, the skies and the earth, is for him. And I'm going to make him Khalifa. I'm going to give him a position. Khalifa in Arabic is someone who comes after someone to take care of something. Someone who comes after someone to take care of something. So that means, again, my wild imagination, that there were people living on earth before us. They did their duty, God knows, for how many thousands of years or millions of years. Then they're gone. And then Adam came after them to replace them to take care of something. Take care of what? planet earth and take care of each other so what we are looking at is Allah number one then before he created you he put a light between your eyes and then showed you to your father Adam number two he made Malaika make sujood to you number three he told the Malaika I'm giving this Adam a position number four he told the Malaika, I'm creating the skies and the earth for him. And he told you and I. Number five, he taught Adam the names of all the things and gave him a knowledge and tested the Malaika and the Malaika didn't know the answer. So after that, he told them to, um, uh, to make prostration to Adam, sujood. Number six, he said, I will give this human a special soul. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي خَالِقٌ بَشَرًا مِّنْ طِينٌ فَإِذَا سَوَّيْتُهُ وَنَفَخْتُ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِ فَقَعُوا لَهُ سَاجِدِينَ I'm going to create a human from clay, mixed of water and dirt. Once I'm done with his creation, and I blow in him of my essence, my spirit, then you all shall fall in, what? In sujood to him. So, imagine... <laughs> Allah has honored us, the humans. I've just mentioned to you six things back to back. Creation of the skies and the earth before creating the human. Number two, creating the human with a wabis of nur, light between his eyes, and then showing us to Adam and introducing us as dots of light 
It's up to you to keep that light or not. Number three, he made, he taught Adam the names of all the things. And while we were in his back, he made the malaika, the angels, make sujood to him. Number four, he blew in Adam of his spirit. Number five, he gave him a title and he called him Khalifa. He's the Khalifa to Allah fil ard, you know, the one who came to take care of something. He has a role, as we said yesterday, the difference between the purpose and the role. And then number six, that there is a direct communication between this insan and Allah. He makes dhikr, you make dhikr of Allah, Allah will make dhikr of you. You make dua, Allah answer. You pray, Allah listens. All of this honor is put together for the human, for you. The human has a great dignity. That's why what Allah said, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and at the end, he said, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ we have honored the children of Adam. Why am I telling you this? Because you have to treat your child with that honor. You have to put that in your mindset when you treat that child. That child is not your slave. That child is not your, like, he came here just to worship you. That child is, is not without dignity. That child was born with dignity, born with integrity, born with honor. And you have to take, put that in mind before you treat your child. You have to look at your child and say, oh my God, I have to respect that child. If you start from that foundation, that will lead to a completely different relationship with that child that you have. Not, oh, it's just my child. S stop talking. Uh, you're, you're bothering me. My life became miserable after you came into my life. I know parents that say that to their children. What are you, a curse on me? And then they will turn around and curse their children. They will do la'nat on the children. Why? Look, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمْ Right? وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ We honored the children of Adam. We carried them, we made them live in the land and in the sea. Look at the prediction that human beings will populate the sea. Now we have ships, a whole ship like a town, a city moving. You, people live on the sea six months on the ships. وحملناهم في البر والبحر ورزقناهم من الطيبات And we've given them of الطيبات, of everything good. We give them رزق. وفضلناهم على كثير ممن خلقنا تفضيلا. And we preferred the human and the insan and the children of Adam over a great portion of our creation, a great preference. Are you listening? We preferred them, the children of Adam, over a great portion. We are preferred over the majority of Allah's creation, not only preferred over the majority of Allah's creation, we preferred a great preference. وَفَضَّلَّاهُمْ عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا Tafdila, because the, the word tafdila is where it means great preference. Allah could have said, وَفَضَّلْنَهُمْ عَلَىٰ كَثِيرٍ مِمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا خلاص, done. Tafdila, great preference. So, do you look at your child like that? This is a mindset. That's why, to me, if you change this mindset, is more important than the, the small talk. Like, but the problem is, the rest is also in the Qur'an, and there is no small talk in the Qur'an. It's all important. But before we dive into this, you have to think. So now, this leads us to uh, 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 an, another mindset. When you look at parenting, what do we look at parenting? We look at parenting as a job. I'm going to teach you things to do, and I'm going to teach you things that you should not do. Okay? Bismillah. Let's start parenting. No. Wrong approach. Before we talk about what you do and what you don't do, first... Oh my God, this gift of Al-Insan that you give me, I want to have a relationship with you. I want to talk to you. I want to get to know you. I want, to, uh, 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 I want you to talk to me. I want to respect you. I want to appreciate you. I actually respect you. Why? Because Allah told me, for this Insan, He created the skies and the earth. Allah told me, this Insan, you, you, the Insan, my child, Allah preferred you over a great proportion of his creation, a great preference. How can I make you claim that preference? 
the nature of the relationship, you're building, you know, if you get this point, just this point, right, which is what we call al-alaqa, the relationship, that you're actually trying to establish a relationship with your child, if you get this right, you got 50% of parenting. No matter what you do after that, it will come out good. If you just get this point, that you're actually, my dear brothers and sisters, I have children, many of you have children here. Isn't every child come to this world with a personality already? Isn't this crazy? Like, you, do you understand that you, the parents, even the mother that carried the, the child in her womb, that you, the parents, your guess, your guess of who your child will turn to be while the mother is pregnant. The mother's guess and the father's guess of what personality you're, is as good as the neighbor's guess. <laughs> like you're completely waiting, like you're, okay, Bismillah, Bismillah, Ya Rabbi, good child, Ya Rabbi, Bismillah, Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, healthy, Ya Allah. Good personality, please, Ya Allah. No pain, Ya Rabbi, Al please be nice to me, Ya Rabbi, Al please. Salihin, Maryam ibn Imran, Yahya, Ya Allah, ibn Zakaria, Isa ibn Maryam, Yusuf ibn Yaqub, Ismail ibn Ibn, please, Ya Allah. You know, because you don't know. And you know, one, one thing, one idea changed my, uh, my perspective on how I do parenting. I realize there is nothing that says that he, my child, is my child, like I'm the father, this is my son and this is my daughter. Do you know if Allah willed, your son could have been your father and your daughter could have been your mother? The only reason why it's not like that, Jazakallahu khair ya Shaykh, I'm the luckiest person alive. Barakallahu feek, shakarallahu lak. This is like a special, please nobody touch this, okay? It's for me, from Shaykh Qari Umar, Barakallahu feek. Azzakallah, may Allah honor you in dunya and akhirah, ya Rabbi. I feel embarrassed. Okay, so Alhamdulillah. Uh, so the idea here is, um, uh, do you know that your son could have been your father? Why not? Who, who says? Who says it cannot happen? The reason only that your son is, the, is because Allah said so. But just Allah, Allah's choice. If your son was your father, how would you have wanted him to treat you? If your daughter was your mother, how would you have wanted her to treat you? And as such, treat them. This is, this is mind shifts, you understand? And I'm, I, this is in the Quran. Like Allah keeps on saying, I am the, I mean, uh, 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 you know, there is ayat that I put in the beginning of the presentation. Sayyidina Hud, you know, from the time of Hud, Allah sent him to Ad. Uh, uh, um, and it's like every time Allah says I, I did you a great favor by giving you children it's one of my uh, great favors in surah also Nuh Allah will give you wealth and children if you ask for his forgiveness and straighten up like children is one of the greatest, I'm telling you, forget all the money Allah gave you, forget all the beauty or handsomeness or smartness and fame that Allah, the greatest gift to you in life is this child. So treat that as a gift. Treat that as the most expensive, most precious, most, I don't know, honorable, highest regard from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he actually entrusted you with a child. Imagine, I keep on repeating, Allah gave me child easy, and Ibrahim alayhi salam got his Ismail at age 82, and Zakaria got his child at age like 83. Like, who am I? I'm nobody. Uh, Ibrahim is crying 82 years, Ya Allah, a child, a child, nobody's listening to me. If you give me a child, I'll raise him like a good Muslim, because nobody's listening. And, and we get him easy. We don't feel that, oh my God, Allah gave me a child. <laughs> Like, it's a big deal. A prophet cried his whole life to get a child, and you got it just easy. And when you think something is easy, then you don't treat it valuably. 
if someone gives you something that this is a million dollar this i don't know piece of gold you don't take that million dollar and throw it on the shelf or something you go and god knows make a safe in the bank and put it and 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 you understand what do you think of your child is your child worth a million dollar or more more because allah created the skies and the earth for him all the gold on the planet is for your child that's that's that we have to change that mindset and we have to know that before you approach um, uh, wanting to teach your child what is beneficial and good habits and good morals and good uh, uh, routine and good you know uh, basically uh, character and habits and be, and, and you want to keep them away from haram and don't do this and do, before all of that Let's first appreciate what we have. First mindset that we need a shift. Second, let's know that the key to a relationship is relationship. You're actually getting to know your child because you actually don't know your child until they come. And you don't know because, you know, another thing, something strange with children, the children that give you a hard time when they're kids, they grow up, they're the nicest kids. <laughs> the kids that sometimes are the nicest when they're children, they give you the biggest heart, heart attack and, and heartache when they're old. You, what happened to you? Like, you, So you even, your child will evolve every few years and you have to know him or know her again. You have to get to know them again. And when you get to know them again, and when they feel that you actually respect them, that you actually respect their opinion, and that's where I find that parents don't know how to pick their battles. If you disagree with your child, on an opinion matter that is not life-threatening there you don't have to be right every time be right where it is ma like major issue and let your child be right so that he feels there is a relationship you know some oh my my father says well uh, you're right oh my god that's a big deal you know he, he said i was right oh you know it means a lot to the child and you said if my father thinks my opinion is good then the whole world should think my opinion is good but your child, you raise him, always you're right. You're always right. You're always right. Small thing, big thing, medium size, large, extra large. You always have to be right because of your ego. Well, do you think your child would want us to hang around and stay around? Or you want, or the child will want to run away from you? Don't try to be right every time. Pick your battles. Focus on the large things. Let go of the small things so that they feel that they have an opinion and a personality realizing that your child is born with a personality you don't teach them a person is is a big realization i feel because sometimes we feel like our children like have to listen to us in everything and they cannot have a personality so it creates fight 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 hatred hatred and, and it's not good realize that your ch yani one of the simple things that uh, 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 my mom used to say uh, she used to say عامل ابنك زي كأنه ابن الجيران. Treat your child like he's the child of the neighbor. Imagine you have a neighbor, doctor. The father is a doctor, and the mother is God knows what. She's also a doctor, and they said we're traveling, and you know our child. You know we can you please host our child for a week? <laughs> You're like of course. I'm your neighbor. How are you going to treat that child for a week? Your kids are going to have the best time for that week. Because <laughs> you're going to behave so different. <laughs> you're going to be nice. Assalamu. Good morning. How are you? Did you have breakfast, mashallah? Because you're in the back of you. He's going to report me to his dad. He's going to report me to his mom. He's going to report. Okay. Oh, mashallah. Oh, don't worry. No, no, no. I'll clean it. Don't worry. No, no. Okay. Oh, that's okay. You made a mistake. That's fine. That's fine. You know, we all make. And your kids are looking. What? Is that my mom and dad? You understand? Treat your child like they are the neighbor's child. They will love you. Because your, your child, you're afraid that the neighbor's child, when they were interested, they would report you to their, so you want them to say the best thing. Don't you think we're constantly being reported to Allah? Is your neighbor's opinion more important to you than Allah's opinion? And you treat your child with dignity. Treat them with respect. Treat them like they are a gift. Treat them with honor. They were born with honor. And this idea that you keep on, you know, some parents, you keep on beating and beating and beating until they take all the dignity out of the child. 
No, they will not be right in a single thing in their life. They will never hear their parents, you're right, I'm very proud of you, mashallah. How did you think about that? That's really smart. I actually didn't think about it myself. <sighs> Your child is now is on the clouds because you said that to them. But you have to be right all the time because you think if your child is right one time and you're wrong, you lost your power, authority uh, in the house. No, no, no. Allah told Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who Jibreel comes on him from heaven, consult the believers around you. Do you know when here Allah revealed that to him? فَعْفُ عَنْهُمْ وَصْفَحْ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ After the Sahaba disobeyed Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the... Uh, uh, 50 of them, the archers in the battle of Uhud, he said, don't leave the mountain, they went down. Allah said, forgive them and pretend it didn't happen. Safih in Arabic, khalas, you never bring it up again. Forgive them, pretend it didn't happen and go back and consult them. Because Allah didn't want Rasulullah to learn the long lesson. I consulted you and then I trusted you and then you didn't listen. I will never consult you again. Allah said, forgive them. Pretend it didn't happen and consult them. The system has to be applied. The system has to be applied all the time. When you have that, my dear brothers and sisters, you know, I find always never miss as I am growing older as a child. Uh, like the, the kids that have good relationship with their parents and their parents value their opinion, they grow up confident, they grow up strong. No other kid in the street can come and take them left field and mislead them and make them all go into alcohol and drugs and haram because uh, who are you? I'm, I'm confident. Even my dad values my, my opinion. Even my mom values my opinion. I'm not a nobody. Eh, my mom and dad consult me sometimes. Seriously, right now, I mean, I have a 24 years old and I have a 23 years old. They're a year and a half apart. I consult them. I literally ask them, what do you think about this? What's the problem? And I've been doing that since I sensed in them maturity. And everyone is smart in a different thing. So I'll ask this son in one thing. I'll ask the other son in one thing. Because one of the things that I used to do is sometimes bring them around me when I'm doing family counseling. So they learned a lot of wisdom and subhanAllah, some of my children, when the husband and wife leaves, they will say, the solution was very simple. She just shouldn't do that and he shouldn't say that. Okay. You're seven years old, you're talking like a 40 years old. That's scary, you know? But you know, they have an opinion. So imagine that you have that. I think this is a key thing. I know your kids frustrate you and I know you scream, but your kid, like let's say, if you're screaming, which we don't encourage because it's not part of the sunnah, but let's say we all scream as parents. Okay, if you scream, I don't know, one time in the day, but the rest of the day, you're like, you're treating them with honor, that they're special, like the, the neighbor's child. They will forget that you scream. They will start laughing it off. Yeah, my, my power, just, just normal, they, they get upset, but, but it doesn't ruin the relationship. But you're always screaming, screaming, screaming. You don't listen to their opinion. You don't discuss with them anything. It's always command, general with a soldier, master with a slave. How are you going to parent like that? That's a problem. So you have to give a room. You also have to give a room for the child to have an opinion, have something, as long as they're not doing haram. So this is something that is very uh, important uh, to me. Realize the value of the human the honor of the human uh, uh, and that Allah created the heavens and the earth for the human and realizing that parenting is first and foremost um, uh, building a relationship. One thing we do, especially for the young children, and please, again, this is a long course. This is like it's supposed to be two full days workshop, like literally eight hours followed by eight hours with a lot of discussion, a lot of exercises. So I'm trying to fit all of within a small number, but the idea here is, remember that when I'm talking to you also, there's something called child development, that also within the Quran and Sunnah, how you treat a child for the first five years to six years to seven years is different than how you treat them next, for the next seven years. Like, any, for example, yesterday I said, if they do something, take something away from them, right? Yes, but when they are between age one and six, don't be too harsh in taking away things. Clean your room, they didn't clean. Don't go crazy, right? 
so there's child development. So when I say something to you, I trust that you're going to look at that child of your, the age of your child, and act according, custom my advice to you according to the age. I will be way more strict with a 13, 14, 15 years old than I am with a 4, 5, 3, 6, you know, still children. Yani, uh, don't make uh, the basis of your relationship and interaction anger. What do I mean also by a relationship? Because when you think your relationship with your child, I'm going to teach you what to do or what not to do, there become no more conversation. When was the last time you sat down? Oh, salam alaikum. Oh, what happened with you today in school? When was the last time you sat down with your child and said, you know, today this happened, then that happened, then this person bothered me, then my boss started doing this, then my coworker tried to stab me in the back. You know what you guys tell me or tell each other when you hang out as friends, like adults? Use the same conversation with your children. Tell them about your day. That's a relationship. It cannot be that the only conversation between you and your child, do this, but don't do that. Do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Where is the relationship? Do you let your heart out to your children based on their age, right? Remember? You have to apply based on the age. In, in Palestine and in every language around the world, we have this saying, in kibir ibn khawi. If your child becomes old, become his brother. Make him your brother. Huh? And the same goes for a girl. Khawiha, yani, become her brother. You know, if your daughter becomes old, talk to her like a brother, like a sister, not like a son or daughter. Halas, they reach a certain age, you treat them in a certain way. When you look that this is a relationship, you let your heart out. If I'm sitting down and I'm a smart parent, my kid is in high school and my heart is burning and I don't know what they're going through, I will say, oh, do you know, let me, this happened in my day and you start talking to them about your day. Now, what is naturally going to happen? They're going to start telling you about their day. That's what you want to know. Because that's in your blind spot. You don't know. And then if they say something that you don't like, oh my God, don't jump. How dare you say that? Okay, the conversation goes from a friend to a parent. They will regret it and they say, I wish I never told you. I knew you were going to do that. You were tricking me. Don't do that. Because then you are parenting in today. Store it in. Three days later, one week later, one month later, you come back with the feedback where it's not reactionary. You say, you know what? You know this when you told me this and this? I have, I have an idea. You know, you can do this and this. And you know what that your friend said? That's not correct. I was thinking about what your friend said and I was analyzing it. And you know, I found Allah said this in the Quran and the Prophet ﷺ said this. And you know, well, you know, that's... Now you give them a way of thinking. You didn't tell them, your friend is wrong. Don't hang out with him. Don't hang out with her. Don't, uh, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. What happened? You want to give them a way of thinking. You take it from them. You find the ayah and the hadith, you come back and you tell them, you know, I was thinking about, you don't tell them, I'm coming to teach you now. No, no. You know, I was thinking about what you said and I was reviewing it. And Allah says in the Quran this, and the Prophet says in the Quran that, in the hadith, you know, alhamdulillah, I practice little of that, not everything I tell you, just for disclaimer that I am perfect in practice. But subhanAllah, one, the, one of the most beautiful moments early on, five, six years old, when I practiced that, and my son came back and said, no, but Allah said in the Quran, this and this. I gave an ayah, he countered me with an ayah. I gave a hadith, he countered me with a hadith. Oh, that's the day I felt like the greatest parent ever. Not that he actually agreed with me, he actually disagreed with me. But all of a sudden became a scholarly discussion. You have to give that room to the child. And from there, now, that's it. You, I taught them how to think. I taught them how I think. So then they can copy that. But if I just tell them, don't do this and do that, and I didn't give them a tool, a standard, a measuring device, a tool to test life and apply things in life. So this relationship is actually we're diving in today's topic, which is <clears throat> dynamic. The dynamic, the style of parenting, the method of parenting in Al-Qur'an wa Sunnah. Uh, uh, 
is very interesting like also honoring the human ar-rahman allama al-quran khalaqa al-insan allamahu al-bayan like allah mentions the insan ar-rahman allama al-quran khalaqa al-insan how important is the insan that allah says i reveal to him my word wow the insan is important i taught him how to speak oh wow okay so then we have to teach our children how to speak but not speak meaning language meaning how to think how to say what they want to say that it has to have matching quran sunnah morals manners ethics tradition culture you know the family culture you know very important a very important dynamic and style of parenting is say you know I understand this, there's a halal and certain things haram, but in our family, we don't do that. Because you will run into a problem if you only run on halal and haram. Your certain things are halal, but you don't want your kid to do it. It's halal in general, but maybe it's wrong in this age and time. So what do you want to say? We, our family, always talk about your family with honor. You know, our parents, we, the, you know, the Prophet ﷺ used to raise Al-Hassan and Hussein. we, Alul Bayt, we don't eat sabaqa. Obviously, that's a fiqh ruling, halal and haram on Alul Bayt. For us, we can also say that. We don't eat sabaqa. We'd rather go and work and starve Unless we're going to die, obviously, then we accept money. But we'd rather starve than accept sadaqah. Because that's in our family, it's like that. Not the whole world. We are proud. My father would never accept a sadaqah. My this would never, etc., etc. You understand? Uh, so this is very important to have that we, our family, that's a style of management that will help you a lot, is distinguish your family from the rest of the families. And, and that's why I tell people when, when they get married, what do you want your a household to be? So I like my household to be a household of knowledge, that we value knowledge, not because of how much money it makes, because knowledge is valuable by itself. We are a household of hosting. We love hosting. We love having guests. We're a household of generosity. If you're out, we are the first to pay the bill. We're not the last to pay the bill. We love to give. We love to share. We're a household of giving, sharing, and charity. A household of hosting. A household of knowledge. We're a household that we, we take care of our own. When one of us fall, we'll all stand together. That's who we are. That's Al-Bakri family. You know, it's... I just made up that stuff. Like, I don't think like there is anything special about my family that is not in your family. But it's just a style of parenting. And I learned that from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. al Hussein runs, there was a little pile of dates. A child, and date is sweet. So he went and took a date. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Kakhin, kakhin, inna la na'kulu sadaqa, put it back. We don't eat sadaqa. And, and with a smile. And al Hussein is like, Obviously, Hussein is young, but he got it because it was given with love. He didn't hit him hard. He said, kakhin, kakhin, inna ala al-bayt la na'kulu sadaqa. We don't eat sadaqa. And he smiled and took him and put him on his shoulder. So it wasn't like, again, beating and screaming and yelling and this and making him feel the worst of mankind. Right? But we all do that as parents. So I'm telling you, if you do that, Immediately make the intention to change your way, to change your style. It's okay. We, we're not perfect. We, we do everything wrong, but Allah gave us Quran so that we start doing everything right. That's fine. It's not too late. And there's no pa perfect parent. We all parents make mistakes. That's why Allah covers our mistakes. Ar-Rahman, allama al-Quran, khalaq al-insan, allamahu al-bayan. This is the insan is your child. Allah is talking about your child. So look at your child with honor and respect. Uh, so alhamdulillah, we basically, uh, awesome, okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim We're gonna move to the, uh, okay. Bye. So basically, when it comes to parenting, method of parenting, 
there is actually uh, there is actually th three types of parenting. It has nothing by with the slide that is showing. By the way, uh, I moved on, but there is three types of parenting. The first style of parenting is what we call the firefighters style of parenting, which is I only get involved when there is something wrong. Call me when something goes wrong. <laughs> this is what? I only interfere when something goes wrong. MashaAllah. Any you're only there when something goes wrong. Usually this is used, this statement, I will admit, because I'm a man and I'm a father, this usually, us fathers do that. You, you mother, you raise the child, anything goes wrong, call me. La. <laughs> Your role is way much, you're not a firefighter. <laughs> so this first style of, man, of, of parenting is firefighters. It has nothing to do with Quran and Sunnah. Luqman was sitting down with his son. His son didn't commit shirk. His son didn't commit zina. His son did not mistreat him. He's preemptively teaching his son through a very nice conversation. What are the priorities? Remember yesterday when we said, who's the highest authority in the house? Allah, his messenger, then the parents. Yani Quran, Sunnah, then the parents, right? So, but Allah is the highest. So, Luqman, first, first issue he tackled with his son is, Ya bunayya la tushrik billah. Please, my son, do not commit shirk. Inna shirka la dhulmun azim. All right? So now, when it comes to parenting, there's two things that I want to share with you. I think this is also a mindset because I haven't got into the dynamics. So there's two mindsets, which is this one, the three types of parenting. There's another mindset that we have to tackle. Second type of parenting is the horse tamer. Wallah, I will tame you. I will make you walk straight. You know, there's a, a saying in Palestine. You know, العجين is very fluffy. Do, do. Do you know if you walk on a do, what are you going to do to the do? You're going to mix it up. I'm going to make you walk on do without even mixing it up. Yani, I'm going to make you walk on your toes. This is something we say in our culture. Yani, I, and, and we think that's good parenting. But that's what? You've just killed the dignity, integrity, creativity, self-worth, confidence, self-esteem of your child. Because I'm going to tame the living daylight out of you. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you that if I just do like this, you know, you will go to the right. I do like this, like a horse. You go to the left. I pull both, you stop. You're going to work, and I'm going to teach you whose boss is here. And then your child becomes, mashallah, because you break his will. He doesn't have a will anymore. He doesn't have an opinion. He doesn't have respect, because his parents don't respect him. The parents think, I'm going to tame you. So then what you end up with? The most miserable child. When that child, when they are children, oh, you're so proud of yourself, so happy. My child listens to me. I just do like this. That's just one, just one thing. And my child stand up and gets into it all. Uh, you uh, expect trouble when you grow up. When this child grows up, two, one of two things are going to happen. He's just waiting for the second that he can leave you and not go through this misery in life. Or he's going to, everyone that is going to come next in his life, he will be an obedient for anyone out there. So anyone will take him left field, right field, up field, down field, because you stole his dignity and integrity and self-worth and self-esteem and self-opinion because he has been tamed to death. He has no more brains in him, no more hearts in him, no more soul in him, nothing. What kind of parenting is that? Is that prophetic? Absolutely not. Is that Quran apps show me a single prophet did that with his son? Look, Luqman is talking to his son like as if he's talking to his friend. Ya bunayya la tushrik billah. That's what the prophet says to his people, right? Allah sends the prophets to say la tushrik billah. Second type of parenting is first type of parenting is who? The what? The firefighter. The second one, the horse tamer. The third is the farmer and builder. 
and that's the Quran and Sunnah. What I said yesterday that Allah said, فَتَقَبَّلَهَا رَبُّهَا بِقَبُولٍ حَسَنٍ وَأَنْبَتَهَا نَبَاتًا حَسَنًا Allah accepted her and Allah grew her like a tree. Maryam alayhi salam. What does a farmer do? Look. Oh, ho. he has to take the weeds out first. Then he has to plow the earth. Then he has to put the seed and then he has to put the water and fertilizers and keep on checking and then it grows and then he has to do it through one year of trimming, second year of trimming, third year of trimming. Then the fruits start coming. But what happens when the farmer, every year the, the fruit will give him, the tree will give him fruits. Khalas. You're going to have fruits for the ish. For the rest of your life you're going to have fruits. Not only today. No, no, no. The, the older the child becomes the better it gets for you you understand so the third style of mashallah jazakul khair this was from qari umar please that's a 1000 dollar cup right there mashallah jazakallah khairan brother <coughs> zahir mashallah mm. may allah bless you shukran but qari umar's tea is better than your tea is that okay with you <laughs> Always. <laughs> Allahu Akbar wa lillahi alham. Jazakumullah khair. <clears throat> okay, so are we good? First type of parenting? Five. Second part of parenting? A third part of parenting? Farmer. You are a farmer. Okay. Second mindset of parenting, and, and this is the last mindset, and this is struck me when I kept on reading the Quran. Okay. <laughs> This is the beauty of the Quran and this is what's going to make you relax and this is what's going to make you love the Quranic parenting and the prophetic parenting. Do you know in the Quran, nowhere it says that parenting is a top-down approach. Like when Allah speaks about the relationship between parents and children in the Quran, Allah does not approach it through telling the parents what to say and do tell their kids to do how does Allah approach it always Allah speaks directly to the children whether that child is you and me like your father mother is still alive right yeah mashallah so you're a child too the approach of the Quran is never to tell the parents except in few incidents I will explain to you what okay this is how you should treat your children nowhere in the Quran the approach of the Quran is how the children should treat the parents. Bottom-up approach, not up-down. Up-down is dislike to the nafs. Bottom-up, your nafs loves it because you're claiming it. So instead, instead, I want to teach you this and this, inshallah, will change your life for the rest of your life, inshallah. Instead of telling your child, Allah says in the Quran, listen to me. Look how much is unbeloved to the nafs. Next time, what are you going to say your child? <sighs> Allah says in the Quran, you should take care of me. Can you please take care of me? <laughs> <laughs> and and I'll, I'll even, okay, you want, Wallah, ya khai, I need someone to take care of me. Wallah, ya khai. Wallah, you're not taking care of me. From giving the child a chore and a command to giving a child a self-claimed a purpose and a self-claimed like it's your job to take care of me it's not my job to to take care of you why didn't Allah tell the parents take care of the children because Allah put that in our fitrah Allah didn't need to tell the parents take care of your child because Allah knows that's built in in your DNA but what is not built in in your DNA is you taking care of your parents so how do you approach your kids a mindset, Quranic mindset. You go to your child and say, well, I, I just want to tell you, Allah says in the Quran, you should treat me like that, please. Can you please like this? Please, like that. Awesome. Please. That's not a command. That's a request. And by the way, this is between you and Allah. You, you want to listen to Allah? Oh, you, you don't want Allah? That's fine. I'm okay. Completely different approach, completely different dynamic, completely different way. And it's very beloved to the nafs. Your child loves it. 
Yeah, I don't know, but I am, I don't know, I'm feeling, I'm feeling, tomorrow I'm going to get breakfast in bed from you. Like I have a feeling I'm going to wake up and you're going to have already made the breakfast and brought it. I don't know, but I just have a feeling. I don't know. You understand? I have an expectation. That your child will get an idea. I'm going to make breakfast every Sunday since you were born. And every Saturday, I am the one who makes and we sit down and eat. Yeah, he surprised me once. Take care of me. Did you get this point? This is a mind shift. It's continental shift. You know what it is? Tectonic shift in approaching the parents. And this is a Quranic parenting. This is prophetic parenting, right? And, 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 and you say it in a nice way. Now, if you get this point, now we're going to dive into the details. I'm going to give you 10 words. What did Allah ask us to do with our parents? And, and here is the best thing. Whatever you're trying to teach your kids to do with you, because Allah, you have to do it with your parents. It's the same religion. No two religions, one for parents and one for children. No, no, no. So lead by example. Are you with me? Lead by example. So are you ready to count with me? Number one. The first word Allah asks us how to we treat our parents. So we're no more telling, talking about our children. Now we're talking about us. And if we understand it, then we know how to explain it to our children. And we're going to tell them, hey, this is not what I want from you. No, 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 no. I forgive you. I don't want anything from you. This is what Allah wants from you to treat me. Uh, me, I don't want anything from you. The child says, oh my God, this is, so this is between you and Allah, not between you and me. Number one, wasayna. The first word that I need you to, wasayna. Wasayna is for wasiyya. Wasiyya is the most dear advice and service a, per, a person does to his beloved one when he's on his deathbed. You understand what I mean? Wasiya is you're on your deathbed and you this is the final advice you're giving your children. Wasiya comes from the heart. Wasiya is when you tell your parents, uh, you know what? I have when I was alive. I gifted your mother this property. Please, this is when I was alive. It was it became no more my property. This became your mother's property. Husband to wife gift. This is not part of the inheritance. Uh, this house that your mother lives in, don't go and kick your mother out and you start fighting and sell the house. This is also part. Min badi wasiyatin yusi biha awdain. You divide the inheritance after there is a wasiya or after there is debt. Yani, you, you, the father left one million, but he has a debt 100,000. You don't take the one million distributed and you tell the 100,000, sorry, my father died. We, we're not going to pay it. La, you first pay the debt. And then you fulfill the wasiya. Maybe your father made a wasiya to your mother, $100,000, and he put it in her bank account. Now you have 800,000 to divide. Min ba'di wasiyyatin yusi biha awdain. The first word that Allah used in the Quran, in the dynamic of the relationship between children and parents, wa wasayna. Just take this word and dive in it deep. I don't have time to dive more deeper, but because there is a lot of things to say, so I'm going to cut myself short. Number two, second word, ihsana. In, in Surah Al-Quran, وَصَيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ إِحْسَانَ وَصَيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حُسْنَا طب, What is Ihsan? I said yesterday, Ihsan has three meanings in the Quran. To do something good in nature. You cannot do evil and call it Ihsan. Yeah, it has to be good, beneficial. You do it to the best of your ability. Every time you do it, you do it better, 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 better. You aim for perfection and you do it with beauty. When something is beautiful, is Hassan. So why Rasulullah named his son, his grandson, Al Hassan? Because he was pretty, like handsome, pretty, cute child. Then Hussein was cuter, so he called him Hussein, which is Amr Umair. Huh? Hassan Hussein. Hussein meaning the little cutie one, the little beautiful one. Now that's the meaning of the Hassan Hussein. Huh? Amr Umair. Uh, 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 Fadil Fudail. 
You understand? This is the rule in Arabic. You 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 make it a little cutie one, right? So that's a, be a beautiful way. So, Rasul, so what is Ihsan to do something beautiful? Do you know when Allah says, وَوَصَّيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حُسْنًا or Ihsana. Do you know that Allah kept the biggest door in the world open for your imagination? How you want to do Ihsan with your parents? It's an open-ended. Do something good, beneficial. Do it better every time. Perfect it. Do it beautiful. Make it beautiful. Either beautiful emotionally, beautiful artistically, beautiful linguistically, the way you talk to them, which we will see. is not there. So are you with me? Number one, what's the word? Wasayna. Number two, Ihsana or Husna. Open-ended. Wasayna, open-ended. Accommodates all the creativity in the world. How are you going to make Wasayna? It's up to you. How are you going to do Ihsana? It's up to you. <coughs> Number three, Allah Azza wa says, Wasayna insana bi walidayhi. Husna, okay. Another open-ended. Allah says in the Quran, Waqul lahuma qawlan karima. Kareem in Arabic has two meanings. Kareem means generous. Kareem means honorable. So it's very interesting that in the Arabian psyche, before the Prophet ﷺ, because the psyche affected the language, you will never ever have a path to honor if you're not generous. You want to be honorable? You have to be generous. If you are bakhil, stingy, between you and honor, uh, valleys and uh, and galaxies galaxies valleys and mountains so innahu laqawlu rasulin kareem allah described jibril alayhi salam like that and prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam tab jibril yani honorable why jibril is generous because every time allah gives him the revelation he gives it to the prophet he cannot wait to give it to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Kareem, he never left anything for himself, you know. And he's honorable. So Kareem in Arabic, generous and honorable. What did Allah say to us to treat our parents? وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا Speak to them in an honorable word. And I tell the children, I tell the children, which is I'm talking to me because my mother is still alive, alhamdulillah. I tell myself, I tell, be creative how you're going to speak to your parents. And you sit down like this, write some poem before you call your parents, especially for us. Be creative how you're going to speak to them and how you're going to talk to them. Because Allah, because I tell them, words are cheap, words are for free. If you cannot be generous with that which is free, how are you going to be generous with that which is expensive? What's for free, words, you're not being generous. What if I tell you give a thousand dollar a month to your parents? Oh, oh, it's going to be a problem. If what is for free, you're stingy. So what did Allah say? وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا Be generous in the words. Be creative how you're going to thank your parents. How you're going to ish? Be nice to them. Wallahi, you know, I have noticed my mom after growing older and seeing, Wallahi, there is no mother like you. I'm so lucky to have you as a mother. Wow, what you taught us when we were kids, how much it's beneficial. Your sayings, your sayings are amazing. You know, one of the things is, uh, it, it's within the city of Al Khalil. We have this proverb. So you make a mistake, and very foolish mistake. So this is what my mom used to say. To whom did you rent it? What? To whom did you rent it? I don't understand. Your brain, your brain. To whom did you lease it out? To whom? Because obviously when you made that choice, you didn't have... A brain. It was leased out. I know you're smart, but that day you it was leased out. Who was using your brain when you made that choice? And I will be laughing, right? It's like, a, what kind of a... But this, look, to whom? Don't lease your brain out, okay? Keep it. Keep it with you. So, you know, these sayings, they have, like, they have impact on you. Like, I should not make a decision without thinking. Truly, what was I thinking? 
Well, obviously, I was not thinking. I was leasing my brain out to somebody else. It was leased out that day. So, you know, these proverbs, that they make a difference. And our cultures are full of proverbs. They're very beautiful. You know, that they it's become, especially when they match Quran and Sunnah, obviously, you know. So, that's, وَقُلْ لَهُمَا قَوْلًا كَرِيمًا What's the first word? وَصَيْنَا What's the second word? Ihsana. What's the third word? Karima. What's the fourth word? We didn't say it yet? Allah Azza wa Jal said in the Quran, one of the dynamics is Anishkur li wali walidayka. Be thankful to me and to my and to your parents. If you know how much the Mufassirin had a heart attack and panic when they came to make this tafsir of this ayah, because nowhere else Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said, do this to me and, except with parents, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa ati'u allaha, wa ati'u rasul. Wa ati'u allaha, wa rasulahu. Obey Allah and his messenger, or obey Allah and obey them. Two different ways. The only other person than Allah, that Allah said, Wa, be thankful to me and your parents. Anishkur li wali walidik. Back again, thankfulness starts with words. Thankfulness translates into action. I'm going to help you in the kitchen. I'm going to help you clean the house. I'm going to help you going doing the cro the groceries. I'm going to help you when I grow up, pay the bills. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to show my gratitude and thankfulness in what? In, in, in every possible way. With words, I'm going to be generous. With actions, being there physically, I'll be generous and thankful. With money, I'll be generous and thankful. You understand? With, with, with me being there for you, I'm going to be generous and thankful. Thankfulness is not, well, shukran. Time. MashaAllah, okay. My mom used to say, where do I cash it? Which bank? Shukran, okay, you're welcome. Clean the table after you eat your dinner. That's your shukran, okay? Wow, well, that was very beautiful food. Okay, I know my food is delicious. Clean after yourself, right? Shukran, where am I going to cash it? Sometimes shukran is not enough. Obviously, you start with it. And that's even with our relationship with Allah. As shukru bil lisan, wa shukru bil janan, wa shukru bil arkan, bil amal, yani bil in action. You, you show Allah, i'malu ala Dawood a shukra, wa qalilu min ibadiya shakur. Oh, work the family of Dawood. Shukr is an action. So, number first word is, wasayna. La, that's the second word. The second word, ihsana. The third word, awlan karima. The fourth word, أَنِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكَ The fifth word, إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرِ Allah has an expectation that one of your parents or both of them, if they are old, that they will live with you. Unless they choose otherwise. Uh, you went to America, I don't want to live in America. My mother, we are four sons here in America and one daughter in uh, Jordan. She chose to live with a daughter and she's a Mabruka alaykum America. You know, Mabruka alaykum. I'm happy. My brothers are here. My sisters are here. My cousins are here. Everybody. Khalas. But she knows when she was here with us, she lived for a year or two. It was from one house to another house between her sons, spoiled like a queen. But she made a choice. I don't want to live with you. Khalas. That's fine. It's not fard, but it's an expectation. And here is something that I want to solve so many marriage problems if you know how to solve this problem because some parents are difficult. So this is a very common problem that happens in Muslim houses and the solution is very simple and easy and we can fix it in no time. The father, of the, the father or the mother of the husband is difficult, very difficult to deal with. So the wife will come and say, I will not deal with your parents. I will not deal with your father. I will not deal with your mother. Uh, they will not live with us. They will make our life miserable. And then, number one, you cannot say that. 
because it goes right against the ayah that I mean, one or both of them, they shall live their old age with you. Second, when the wife sometimes is not, this is an unreasonable wife. And the same thing, the husband says, I don't care. I'm not responsible about your mother. This is my household. لا يا حبيبي, you are responsible. Why? Because your children are going to treat you the same way they see you treating their grandparents from their mother's side. That's their blood and flesh. The, your kids' blood and flesh came from these grandparents. If you're not going to take care, you're teaching them by example. That were, I don't care. I'm not responsible. Your mother keeps on criticizing me. Your mother keeps on this. This is unreasonable. If the husband says that to the wife, and the wife, her parents have nowhere else to live except in her house, what does the wife do? She's going to live in hasra. She's going to live in like her life. My parents needed me, and I wasn't there for them because my husband said no. Or the other way around. This will make one spouse hate the other because to the max, to the end of life. And, and not only your husband or your wife will hate you for doing that, Allah will be displeased with you. Allah will be displeased with you, right? But here is another reaction. That's the max. The minimum is the wife tells the husband or the husband tells the wife, yani, your parent is really difficult. And she criticizes everything that I do. And he criticizes as if I'm not the man of the house, as if I'm not the woman of the house, depends who's speaking. So then now the other person becomes offended. Now, if you take the other spouse aside and you ask him, is your parent difficult? He'll say, oh, Allah, very difficult. My whole life I was so. Why are you denying it in front of your wife? So this is my advice that solves the problem in five seconds. The husband and wife are a team. Together they talk. So when the wife tells the husband, uh, your parent is difficult, the husband says, one, I acknowledge, that's, that's true. But what can I do? Allah asked me to take care of them. The wife answered, of course we're going to take care of them. Second thing, your father and mother hurt me and attacked me and humiliated me. And this, the husband answered, oh my God, I acknowledge that. Wallah, the way you reacted was very impressive. You didn't go off on my parents. I respect you for that. I love you for that. I am really, you really captured my heart for that. When someone is being humiliated by a parent-in-law, don't deny, acknowledge the pain, acknowledge that your parents are difficult, and then go and do what Allah asks you to do as a team. So the wife will tell her husband, don't worry, your mother is difficult, but she's your mother. And she has a lot of good other qualities. And Allah says we should take care of our parents. Khalas, as long as you acknowledge my pain, and you acknowledge that your parent is difficult, I will work with you till the day of judgment. Because if our children sees that we took care of our parents, they will take care of us. هَلْ جَزَاءُ الْإِحْسَانِ إِلَّا الْإِحْسَانِ so that's something because the husband and wife cannot acknowledge because the husband thinks if I say my father is difficult my mother is difficult that's humiliating she's trying to put me down no 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 that's all shaitan work the wife if I acknowledge my father that's a work of shaitan acknowledge that your parent is difficult acknowledge the pain of the other spouse and now together as a team handle the parents not as enemies as a team and then be smart. If it's a small house, rent the next apartment. If it's a house, mashallah, build an in-laws unit or give them the garage with a bathroom with this so that they, your parent can have their privacy and you can have your privacy with your wife and children. Also, parents like some sort of privacy, right? Tayyip, it is difficult. Wallahi, ya Sheikh, we did all of that and she still criticizes me in everything. Tayyip. That is your test in life. Handle it. Would you like a bad mother-in-law or would you like cancer? Choose. Life is a test. What, which test? Would you like a bad mother-in-law, which is the word bad is not appropriate. Would you like a difficult mother-in-law or would you like your husband to lose his job and you cannot pay your bills and buy groceries? Yalla, tfadda. Go ahead. Choose. Allah, I'll take, I'll take a difficult father-in-law, mother-in-law, then taking one of these things. People want life to be perfect and comfortable. 
I tell you, which is something that you have to know, one of the big ideas about life, it's like a mindset about life, pain, and, pain in life comes from five areas. Physical sickness, financial in any way, you know, you lose money, you lose investment, you lose your job, you lose financial, physical, financial. The third one is loss of loved ones. People die that are beloved to you. That causes so much pain. Number four, relationships. That's the one we're talking about. Your spouse will give you a hard time. Your child will give you a hard time. Your parents will give you a hard time. Your brother or sister gives you a hard time. Your boss at work gives you, it's called relationship. That's a source of test in life, right? So health, wealth, uh, 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 what's the third one that I said? Last of loved ones, relationships, and there is a fifth one. I don't know why I forgot it, but there is a fifth one. Loss of health, loss of wealth, loss of loved ones, uh, difficult relationships, and the lack of security. Oh, that's the biggest one of them all. Yani, when you think of, Ya Rabbi, Ya Adim, Ya Kareem, Stop the war in Gaza, Ya Rabb al -Alamin. Ya Allah, grant them security and peace. Ya Allah, grant them food and shelter, Ya Rabb al -Alamin. Ameen. When Allah said to Quraysh, they should worship me. If Allah said, Quraysh should worship me, should Allah give a reason why Quraysh should worship him? Well, Allah doesn't need a reason. Quraysh should worship me because I am God and I am created them. But Allah said, فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ And Allah gave a reason. الذي أطعمهم من جوع وآمنهم من خوف. Economy and security I give Quraysh. If only for that they should worship me. Wow. Short surah in the Quran talks about societal change and societal perspective. That no society will be a society without security and economy. This is like philosophy, Islamic philosophy, or I don't like the word philosophy, Islamic ideology 101. What, how do you establish a society? Security and economy. And we'll know if you lack the economy, people will start killing each other. If people kill each other, the economy cannot flourish. They're tied to each other. Our people in Gaza are going through the five together. No security, loss of loved ones, loss of wealth, loss of health. And relationships are, you know, when you are under war, you become angry like, and short-tempered. And so relationships are suffering. So they are going through five of them all in one. May Allah help them. May Allah help them. May Allah help them. May Allah be there for them and enable us to be there for them. Ameen, Ya Rabbi. Wallahi, Ya Akhi, Ajeeb, Ajeeb, SubhanAllah. So when you have a difficult father-in-law or mother-in-law, well, pick and choose. Yeah. Well, you want to lose your security? Go ahead. What? Do you, do you want to lose your health? Do you want to lose your wealth? Do you want to lose loved ones? Or do you want to have a problem in relationships? Yeah, it's okay. What can I do? Your father-in-law is the hard, difficult. Deal with it. Or tell Allah, I don't want that. Can you please give me cancer? Yani, what do you want? <laughs> and a believer says, you know, the Salihin used to say, we love what Allah chose for us. What Allah chose for us is the best for us. Nothing will happen to us except what Allah wrote for us. You know the word lana is different than alayna. Not, the believers don't say what Allah wrote on us. No, no, no. Whatever Allah wrote for us. Meaning the test and the hardship is also for you to purify your sins. Tayyip? Huh? To, to elevate your ranks, to make you go to Jannah. Wallah, and I, I will remind you, and inshallah you remind me. On the day of judgment, that father-in-law that gave you a hard time, you're going to hold them like that, and you're going to kiss them here and here and here, and here. on the day of judgment, because you're going to go to Jannah because of your sabr with them. <laughs> you're like, shukran, oh, you were the nicest, thank you so much. I, I'm going to Jannah because of you. you. You should have been more harder, or I would have went to a higher level in Jannah. You understand? Pick and choose. So, number one, word. Wasayna, number two. Ihsana, number three. Wa qul lahuma. Qawlan kareema, number four. 
أن يشكر لي ولوالدي كان number five عندك you can say the word عندك means at your place إما يبلغنا عندك الكبر أحدهما أو كلاهما فلا تقول لهما أف ولا تنهرهما وقل لهما قولا كريما إن شاء الله we gonna we still have another words ما شاء الله طيب now another dynamic. This is big one. This is like this is where the juice. This is what I was talking to you before. If you think, oh, where did I get this idea of a relationship? Allah said to us towards our parents and told our children to treat us like that, that we should befriend, befriend, wasahibuhuma. So that's the word number six, wasahibuhuma. Befriend both of them. Befriend both of them. Now, I should befriend my parents, but here is where I ask you and I request you, allow the space for your child to become your parent, to your friend. Because you as a parent, in your dynamics, your child comes and says, Assalamu alaikum, Baba. Kev halak, ish akhbarak, what's going on? How are you? Don't talk to me like that. You just killed it. No sabah al khair, no salamu alaikum, no kif halak. Okay, what do you want me to do? Throw the garbage out. Throw the garbage out. No, coming talking to me like that. Yeah. You think you're my friend? Yes, he's your friend. Because Allah is telling him, become the friend of your father. He came to implement Allah's guidance. You shut the door in his face. How is he going to be your friend if you're not allowing it? How is he going to be your friend if you're not allowing it? So many times we don't recognize that we're shutting the door in front of our kids. And, and by the way, when I say this, I'm well aware of something that is all through the Quran. Friendship with your father and mother is not the same way. Friendship of peers of the same age. So Allah is not saying that. Like, you know, friendship with respect. Yani, I'll give you an example, the best example ever. Allah says, Allahu waliyu alladheena amanu. Allah is the wali of the believers, guardian, protector, guide, wali. <coughs> but also Allah in the Quran says, وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلِيَاءُ بَعْضُ The believing men and the believing women, they are awliya for each other. This is confusing. Allah is my wali or the believers are my wali? Both. But Allah is your wali as a god. As God Almighty, Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, Rabbun Nas, Malikin Nas, Ilahin Nas, is your guardian and wali. But you also should watch my back. You are my wali as a human in the world of human beings. So just like the word wali, Allah used it, that Allah is your wali, and then the believer is your wali, your friend at school is your sahib, and your father and mother are your sahib, but and not the same way. And there is respect so, uh, <laughs> and here I want to heal the idea because I saw parents doing that. They think, oh, I am a modern father. I, I want to be the friend of your my, my son or daughter. And then they overdo it. They what? They overdo it. They have a par parents have a dream in their mind that they need to adjust, which is, I, when my son or daughter grow up, I want them, I want to be their best friend. No, please, please don't do that. Just be a friend, please. Uh, best friend is the same age. You know what they call them, BFF, best friend forever, right? That's the same age. You know what, I, <laughs> you understand? <laughs> so the idea here is what? Is befriend them, but don't, because their best friend if your child's best friend start telling them what to do and what not to do, they cannot be your best friend. You are their friend. So I have many parents says, I don't know, I feel like I failed. Uh, my whole life I was imagining my son will be my best friend and he's not. He just don't. I said, no, 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 give up. You are their friend and their father. You tell them what to do and what not to do in certain points when Bush comes to shove. You have to put your foot down and say, no, you cannot do that. And that cannot allow you to be the best friend. No, best friend is same age. They joke, they push this and this. And another funny thing that actually happened, so that 
The father came to the son. The son is 13, 14, still learning life. You know, I want to be your best friend. Really, Baba? You're going to be... So the kid, zero wisdom, يعني, what experience? Allah. He started talking to his dad like a best friend. And next thing, <sighs> smack on the face. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> you wanted to be a best friend? But he's 13 years old and he comes to me and he said, my son. And then when he explained the whole thing, I started laughing. He started laughing at himself, right? <laughs> you know, like, you know, because you cannot be the best friend. So we want them to be friends, but not the best friend because it's a friendship with <laughs> respect. So be careful, you know. Alhamdulillah. So, uh, mashallah, word number one. وَصَيْنَا الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ Now number two, حُسْنَا or إِحْسَانَا Number three, كَرِيمَا وَقُلْ لَمُقَلْ كَرِيمَا Number four, أَنِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكَ إِلَيَّ الْمَصِيرِ Number five, عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرَ إِمَّا يَبْلُغَنَّ عِنْدَكَ الْكِبَرَ That they go to old age with you and at your home. Number six, وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفَةً You befriend your parents in a respectful way and you allow your kids to befriend you in a respectful way. The next word that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Al-Quran is جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ So Allah gave us a mental image to make us understand that you should lower the wing of humility. Yani, as if you are a bird and you have two wings. What does the wing? Makes you fly, fly high. So now you're a big shot, you're flying high. Okay, but with your parents, you, you lower your wing, they walk on your wing, they ride on your wing, you carry them over you. Why? Because Allah Azza wa Jal knows in the in human interaction, Sometimes the parents, many times, will go overboard. خلاص. That day he had a bad day, your father. You said a small word, he explodes in your face. You know you didn't deserve that. What does Allah say? When it comes to your parents, you, not, not, not humbleness, la, 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 la. Humbleness, that's with the people, your friends, people outside. No, no, with parents, humility. If your father one day or your mother one day lost her temper, this and that, and went overboard and insulted you and humiliated you and walked all over you, what happens? You take it. You take it with a smile, with a dignity, and you go to Jannah with it. It's okay. But that cannot be a daily policy. Every day I'm hum humiliating you. La but you know, you know what I'm talking about. Your father one day, like, what happened? I didn't say anything. Someone made him upset in the market or something. You're the first one, you got it. You're like, I'll take it. I'll take one for the team. I'll take one for my dad. I'll take one from my mom. You know, you don't know what your mom and dad are bothered with. And so they're your children. But, I mean, the, the beating example is an extreme. I'm talking like your parents overreact with you. You feel insulted. There is no, I feel insulted with parents. The wing of humility. You know the word dhul is not good in the Quran, in Arabic language. Dhul yani humility, yani humiliation. Lower the wing of humility. Only Allah tells you to use that with parents because they have a right upon you because they devote, devoted their whole life for you. But you don't, as a parent, you don't do it every day to your children. Yani once in a while you overreact. Allah gives, Allah has your back in the Quran. وَخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ So this now, lower the wing of humiliation to them. It's okay. If your parent said something humiliating, that's fine. Your mother hurt your feelings, that's fine. I know a lot of kids that they grow up and they are like living a trauma for the rest of their life. They're living as a victim of the past. What happened in the past? That the parents humiliated them. Like, uh, that is wrong. On daily basis, that's what I have been fighting since the beginning of this source. Do not 
humiliate your kids do not treat them like slaves do not treat them like a soldiers and you are the generals you i've already made my case but i'm saying once in a while the parents said something one day said another one day the kid is living in trauma the kid i'm saying now 40 50 60 years still upset and mad at their parent that they humiliated them when they were five years old and when they were 15 and when they can they can count the incidents on one hand and they're still live yeah habibi khalas, let go of it let go of it that's your mom and dad she carried you in her womb let her say whatever she wants you don't have to get back at her and teach her a lesson and teach her that she's wrong that's not your place if you're not going to have parents patience with your parents who are you going to have patience with so allah said وَخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ ذُلِّ the next word, mina rahma. So now we are at word number what? Eight, mina rahma, of mercy. Treat your parents with mercy. The mercy word, mercy in the Quran is mentioned. One of the ulama, I think he's from Morocco, wrote 14 meanings, 14 colors of mercy in the Quran. That Allah used this and then he said, that's a mercy. Yani the rain is a mercy, the rizq is a mercy, the forgiveness is a mercy. 14 different colors of mercy. Let's take one color, which is what I'm talking about. I felt Allah said, وَغْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ ذُلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ the, the rahma Allah is referring to here. One of the colors, one of the colors of rahma is to forgive. Ya akhi, your parent, God knows what they wear especially sometimes with our non-muslim brothers and sisters the, the father maybe god knows what how what how he violated his child <coughs> right they're not alive or they're not control of you if you can find it in your heart to forgive them and have mercy on them forgive them and have mercy on them yeah, and sometimes some fathers and mothers really oppress their kids really really and and i will not make light of that and I will not say they are fine and they're excused. No, parents wrong and they will meet Allah and Allah will judge them and they will be, Allah will do his business with them, punish them or not. For me, may Allah forgive my parents. I forgive my parents. But I cannot speak in the name of everyone that was violated by his parents. I heard stories that made my hair go white and gray. Parents violating their children physically, sexually, harassment this uh, that's a whole different level that i was not exposed to so i will not make light of the suffering of the child because maybe the father violated the child in ways that we don't even understand so but what allah says so that's number eight eight number nine make dua for them Ya Allah, have mercy upon them. Look how the word mercy now twice, back to back. By the way, this one ayah, وَخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ ذُلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمَةِ وَقُلْ رَبِّ إِرْحَمْهُمَا كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرَ Do you know this sentence, كَمَا رَبَّيَانِ صَغِيرَ is a, is a lesson in itself. What Allah is telling you, what your parents did for you is in your blind spot. Do you remember when you were in your mother womb for nine months? That never even comes to your mind. Do you remember when you were one year old, two years old, and diaper changing back and forth? Never. You don't remember. Uh, some of the sisters here remember, actually, there was a sister that she remembers since she was one year old. I said, that's very scary. I'm glad I don't remember when I was one year old, you know. So, uh, the, the memory start registering very well at age 10 on average human being so the first 10 years of your life the love and vacations and i love you they don't remember it so allah reminds you of it as they raised me when i was a kid when i don't remember what they did for me but they did a lot wonderful so how many words do we have nine and then the final word in the quran and positive word albir so you know sayyidna yahya allah says wa barran bi walidayhi sayyidna isa wa barran bi walidati i'm good to my mother walidah is the female walid is the male or 
Walidain is both parents. Wabarram bi walidayhi. Yahya was has bir towards his parents. Isa alayhi salam had bir towards his mother. Okay? So this word bir, it means, like, I don't know, kind and ethical and beautiful and polite and in service, in service of the parent, in service of the parent, in service of the parents, with kindness and a smile and politeness and forgiveness and mercy, Put all of that together, you come up with the word bir. It's, why do I mention it, the last one? Because one through nine is number ten. Bizarre. It's a summary. Uh, so, Ihsan, do something good. Do it with as perfect as possible and make it beautiful. These are three Colors of also a word bir. When you do something good towards your parents, that's bir. You do it with perfection, bir. Do it with ihsan, bir. Bir is, is bir describes the action in the world of relationship. Yani bir is ihsan in the world of relationships. But the word ihsan can be used in something that has nothing to do with relationship. Wa ahsin kama ahsan Allahu ilayk. And it could be used in relationships. So the word ihsan is general, and the word bir always uh, in human relations. That's why Allah said, the non-believers who don't fight you, nor kick you out of your homes, nor fight you with your deen, treat them with bir, treat them the nicest you can treat them, and be fair, be fair to them. Justice Yani, just because they're not Muslim, you don't be unfair. No, you justice and beauty. So the word bir is what? So 10 dynamics. So the last, let's go and review. Word number one. al insana bi walidayhi. Word number two. Ihsana. Number three. Wa qul lahuma qawlan karima. Word number four. Anushkur li wali walidayka. Word number five. Imma yablughanna indaka al-kibar is to, uh, they go in old age at your home, right? Word number six, wasahibuma, befriend your parents. Word number seven, uh, lower the wing of humility. Uh, of what? Of mercy. Uh, word number seven is, uh, eight is mercy. Word number nine, dua. Word number ten, al-bir. Ten words in the Quran that gives you pure dynamics. But they are all general in, in nature to allow you creativity for your time and space. Different times. Uh, now you buy your father a car before you bought him a horse. And it, it, the, so the words are general to allow and accommodate for this. So these things, these ten words are very important. Let me let's try for our also English viewers. I, I realize we're not saying them in English. Word number one, we highly recommended the human to take care of their parents. Highly. With love and passion and compassion. And word number two, do it with beauty, perfection, and do something good. Word number three uh, is what? Be generous with your words and be generous with your actions and your feelings and your care. Number word number four, be thankful to your parents. Word number five, take care of them when they become old. Let them live with you and take care of them. Word number six, befriend them, become their friend. Word number seven, Lower the wing of humility. It's okay if your parents try to, you know, one day they humiliated, take it, right? Take it like a champ, they say, right? Word number eight. Be merciful to them. Word number nine. Make prayers, supplication, and dua for them. Word number ten. All the above combined together with so much passion and so much goodness and so much this. And this is how... Allah describes the relationship between us and our parents. So look how in these 10 words, there is a lower assumption that Allah did not mention, which is your kids listens to you. They have to listen to you. But how did Allah say it? He said it. One, two, three. 
if they command you to associate partners with God or to disbelieve in the existence of God altogether or to disobey God, then do not obey them, which means obey them and everything else. So Allah does not mention obedience in the Quran as one of these 10 words. It's, it's permeating, it's happening, it's the foundation. Allah didn't mention it directly because Allah knows if he mentions that directly, people will leave the 10 words and will hung out on word number 11. Allah said in the Quran, listen to me. Allah didn't say it and we say he said it. <laughs> Imagine if he actually said it. So that's what I am saying. So this is a good time to take a break because the next words are what Allah told us not to do with the parents. So there's another 10 words. You're good with that? You're ready with that? So uh, what time is it now? 12.10. Uh, Salah is 12.30. Uh, okay, 20 minutes, we don't have much time. Uh, what are the three types of parents? Firefighter, horse tamer, and a farmer. Okay, very good. Uh, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Uh, let me see if I can tuck in something. Uh, small that can fit within uh, uh. by the way I like to attribute knowledge I will uh, after Salat al-Dhuhr uh, I will refer you to a Moroccan living scholar his PhD in psychology and this I keep on forgetting his name. I will tell you his name right now. Uh, and some of the things that I said, for example, the three types of parenting parents, he has identified that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusts us that when we learn something from someone that we <laughs> attribute uh, it to the person um, that we learned it from because that's how ilm is. So I don't want to look cool and take credit for something uh, that I did not. And that's, uh, so his name, Dr. Mustafa Abu Saad. Mustafa Abu Saad, for those who speak Arabic, the man has done, mashallah, la quta illa billah. I personally uh, learn from him when I watch his lectures. I have never met him, but he's alive right now. And he gives uh, lectures all over the Arab world. And I think probably he will be speaking French by nature. So he probably also in the French world. Uh, but mashallah, very uh, ahead of his time. A man that, that figured out uh, this. And he is a Moroccan scholar and PhD in, I think, psychology or something like that. And benefited the Muslim world, at least the Arab-speaking world, with his knowledge. And uh, I'm using this, the three types of parents. I used to say them, but not like nicely like that. So I learned how to say them nicely from him. So to me, that's very important that we attribute the knowledge to where we learned it uh, from. Another thing that he mentions, and I will say this, style and dynamics, simple actions. He mentions this, and I would like to uh, share with you how different kisses and different touches means different things to children and you should do all of them. So uh, when you kiss your child on the forehead, that is the kiss that you are proud of them. Pride. Come, 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 man. You did a good job, man. Come, let me kiss your head. Kiss of the head in the Arabic culture, Muslim culture is always for honoring. We even kiss our ulama on the head. We kiss their hand and their head, right? Some ulama don't like someone to kiss their hand like me, and I'm not even uh, alim, but you know, and, you know, the idea is they, I, uh, you know, I like, if you want to kiss me on the head, that's better. I'll kiss you back on your head and we're even, you know? But uh, the idea is the kiss of the head is what? Is a kiss of pride. I'm proud of you. The kiss on the, uh, uh, and I'm sorry, and when I say the head, like you kiss here, like on the hair, basically. You hold the head and you kiss the head on the hair and then you put the head back. The kiss on the forehead is a kiss of uh, 
calmness and I'm confident in you. I I I like you, right? Um, uh, also, the kiss on the cheeks is the kiss of I love you, right? The kiss on the hand, whether your child kisses your hand or you kiss their hand, is I am pleased with you, right? I am pleased with you, you know? So when you kiss your child on their hand, MashaAllah, you did the good job. I'm so happy. And you kiss them on the hand, right? Because um, this happened at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and it happened uh, and, and it's happening today within the Muslim world is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Al-Hasan wal Hussein and Usama ibn Zayd were all jumping on him. So uh, so he kissed al Hussein on his cheek and then he kissed al Hussein on his lips. Prophet Sallallahu lips touched al Hussein's lips radiyallahu anhu wa So Al-Aqra ibn Habis radiyallahu anhu wa was a Bedouin. He said, Ya Rasulullah, you kiss your children? Boy, boy, you kiss him? I have ten sons and I haven't kissed a single one of them. The answer of the Prophet Sallallahu was very high discipline. He, say, he looked at him and he said, and what can I do for you if Allah has taken the mercy out of your heart? Oh, the Sahabi apologized to the Prophet wasallam, got up, ran home, and kissed every one of his children. And they were all flabbergasted, like, what happened to that today? What's going on? Why he's kissing us, right? So this kissing is part of the sunnah, and it's very brilliant that uh, Dr. Abu Sa'ad uh, noticed that and singled it out as a tip how many times do you kiss your kid every day forehead cheeks you can do like the prophet وسلم, from the lips like i like you so much right um hands cheeks forehead head right so this is uh touch now touches and he extracted that also from the sunnah of the prophet when you touch from the back, like this, from the back of the head, that's the touch of mercy. You do like this. Hmm? When you touch the uh, from here, you do like this for the head. Again, it's like, man, what did you do? Good job. Pride. So the kiss on the hair, top of the head like this, and the touch on the head is I'm proud of you. Okay? Then... Uh, when you hold your uh, child like this, hold it. I miss you. Hmm? You can do that when you come home and you hold your child like that. You will have you, oh, I miss you, I miss you, I miss you. And they could be young or old, by the way. Uh, by the way, the Prophet ﷺ used to kiss his daughter Fatima as a full adult on her head and make her come and sit down next to him and hold her hand in his hand. They will be sitting like this. So the other hand is coming from here and will hold holding like this, right? So this closeness, that we're talking about what? Relationship. So we're having tips on relationships. So uh, you touch from the back, mercy. Touch from the top, I am proud of you. You hold a cheek like that, you should touch because not touching, deprives the children and creates a distance between, and it's in the sunnah also. Uh, you touch, uh, you put your head, especially when your kid goes to sleep, you put like this, you read Quran. It is the touch of Sakina. So kissing on here is also kiss of Sakina and touching is touch of Sakina. There's even recent research about that, like when you touch a person like that. That's why like the, the patient always like when the uh, the doctor or the nurse touch put their hand like that, take the temperature or you know, you know, calm down, like the mother does that to her child, you know, that's sakina, right? And then um, when you hold the hand and you walk with them with your hand, that's the touch of connection, like Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi will make Fatima sit next to him. They'll rub shoulders, and he'll hold her hand like that. 
right? After kissing her forehead, then come and sit next to me, and then they will do what? They will hold hands. Subhanallah. So uh, these are, um, let's say, one, two, three, four, five touches. Touch back of the head, mercy. Touch top of the head, pride. I'm proud in you. Hold the cheeks, I miss you. Put the hand on the forehead. I want to give you peace and security and care, right? And then uh, holding the hands is connection. Uh, there is, uh, we missed uh, also, the same thing applies. A kiss on the top of the head, forehead, cheeks, hand, and lips. So also five kisses and five touches. All driven from the sunnah of the Prophet Look when someone studies and extract things that would not even, even come to your mind. Like how did he even think about that? Right? So I'd like to attribute that to Dr. Abu Sa'id. Jazahullahu khayran. Barakallahu fi. Uh, and that will conclude uh, something that could have fit uh, within the... Uh, So, uh, let's do five minutes question, or four minutes, and then we get up for Salat al-Dhuhr. Anyone has a question? Yes, brother. Sorry. Walaikum as Sorry, in terms of taking care of parents, so there are uh, parents have multiple children, and they have preference to take care of Whoever the parents choose. So I saw some parents love one kid more than the others. Khalas, if they love him more, don't be, don't get your feelings hurt. We see sometimes in within our cultures that the parents will pick the Baijan or the Baji, you know, the oldest girl, the oldest daughter or the oldest son. Also in the Arab culture like that. But sometimes the youngest one they pick because he was like, a, you know, the spoiled kid and then he spoils the parents. Whatever the parents choose, if the parents choose to go from a house to a house to a house, that's also good. Okay, so I will leave that to the choice. If they don't want to live with any of their children, they want to live alone, that's also their choice, right? But that's something very important. Yes, sister. Wa uh, alaikum salam. Uh, the hostel. Uh, the hostel. Uh, a horse tame approach, yes, yes, yes. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I have seen the thing that fixes if the parent used the horse tamer approach and was very tough and rough and strict with the kids and they grew up and they ran away from them. How can the parent fix it? And the answer to that sit down with them like another complete human being, as I said to you, as another insan. Admit and uh, to them that you were wrong. Acknowledge that you did not do the best. Uh, tell them that that's what you knew, how to do and what to do it. Make them whole and complete. I would even go as far, and this is not required, I'm just going off my head, to apologize to them and ask them, how can I make you whole and complete and tell them, right now I have recognized that my ways were wrong. I want to follow the right way and I want to become your friend and I want to befriend you because you're adult. I will always be your mother or I will always be your father, but can, can we start a new page? Most kids, if the parents say that, it heals them from inside. The problem is the parent wronged and wronged and wronged and they will never admit it. And they will never say I did something wrong. And they will go and argue, no, you were wrong. But at this point, Allah is there, subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you were not wrong, you were okay. And your child was wrong, right? But you said, I'm sorry. It's not going to make you any less. It's not going to change the fact that maybe you were right and your daughter was wrong, 
But she thinks she is right, and now she's an adult. How do we solve the problem? One of the two has to have a bigger head and bigger heart. خلاص. Okay, you think I'm wrong? I was wrong. And say it genuinely, and this and this, and say, I want to have your mic, my child, but you're my friend. I want to have a normal relationship with you. I acknowledge your pain. This means a lot to the generation born and raised in America. I acknowledge your pain. I apologize for it. I want to make you whole and complete again. I want to start a new page. I'm not proud of what I did. I wish I didn't do it. I hope, I wish, because now I found out in Quran and Sunnah that that's actually the wrong approach. This, that's the, the most I knew when I was a kid and had a kid, which was you. So please, I ask for your forgiveness and let's move forward. And that's in a severe case. Sometimes you don't have to go that, I apologize, and but you just have to, you know, I recognize, I acknowledge, and this. And then you will find them like you healed something in them. You will find them crying, sometimes weeping and sobbing, that you actually just acknowledged, right? And then they will be more than happy to move forward. But someone is going to take the initiative in this case, you know? And that's what I know, Wallahu A'lam, if I said the right thing or the wrong thing. But that's my take on it. جزاكم الله خير سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا نستغفرك ونتوب إليك بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين So these are the ten words that we mentioned uh, in the Quran um, <coughs> So, based on the first section, does anyone have a question? Okay. Anybody would like to take a question, inshallah? Wonderful. Ma'rufa. Uh, actually, uh, is another general word. Actually, thank you for catching it. It's another word in the Quran. وَصَاحِبُهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفَ Ma'roof is in goodness. And also Ma'roof is from the Urf also, which is مُتَعَارَفْ عَلَيْهِ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ So you know when I told you the friendship of father and son is not equal, but friendship of sort of friendship, but with respect. The word Ma'roofa explains that. وَصَاحِبُهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا Ma'rufa in an acknowledged. So ma'ruf in the Quran has two meanings. First meaning, something good. Al-amru bil ma'ruf wa nahi anil munkar. Ma'ruf is something good. But also it, its fundamental meaning in Arabic, it means something recognizable, acceptable, agreed upon by the society that it is good. Something so that's the word ma'roof allows for different cultures to consider different things ma'roof as long as it's halal. So something could be ma'roof in this culture, but it's not a big deal in another culture. Or it could be a big deal in another culture, but not in this culture. So ma'roof is doing something good based on the urf, right? Etc. which is based on the culture, as long as that culture does not deny Quran and Sunnah or contradicts, I mean. So now... We need another ten words that yes, please go ahead. Yes, and this ayah because I mentioned um, basically trying to see here. Yes, I actually should have my glasses, but oh, that's fine. Oh, yeah, but then fi buyuti ish. أن تأكلوا إيش من بيوتكم أو بيوتي أمهاتكم ولا آبائكم أو بيوتي أمهاتكم the houses of your fathers أو بيوتي أخوالكم or you eat at the khal look how the Quran is mentioning these positions in the extended family أو إيش بيوتي إيش إخوانكم أو بيوتي أخواتكم أو the houses of your sisters أو بيوتي أعمامكم أو بيوتي عماتكم the father's brother or the father's sister أو بيوتي أخوالكم the house of your mother's brother 
the mamu and the mother of mother sister or khalatikum or beauty khalatikum which is the mother sister uh malakat aymanukum something so again aw sadiqikum or the house of your friend so it's talking about here in extension the extended family in other ayat talks about the wabanatul akhi wabanatul ukht you know the son the daughters of your brother and the daughters of your sister so it's very very it's actually talking about some hukum fiqhi but it's interesting that Allah named those that's the extended family right? according to the Quran yeah. as Allah mentioned them in relationship to you and he mentioned that to them in relationship to them so everyone is reading the ayah as if the ayah came to him or to her and then you look around you my nieces my nephews my this my uncles my aunts my cousins and it's a very beautiful thing alhamdulillah anyone else the list of don'ts um very good so allah told us with our parents something you all know and you have heard a million times so of is a word made of two letters and it is uh, it denotes uh, i am bothered I'm overwhelmed. I'm. You're giving me too much work. You're giving me a lot. I can't handle it. Um, I don't want to do it. It's too much. Leave me alone. Come on. Why only me? Why can't you tell my brother, my sister? Why can't I? Why can't I be someone else? This is. It's all within off. And even, you know, you know, off means like oh. Come on, man, just leave me alone, right? So this often, they say, linguistically, it's like the, the, the smallest word is made of two letters. And of is made of two letters. So if of you should not say, then if the word is three letters, or four letters, or five letters, or two words, or three words, then you shouldn't say it also. Because if the shortest word is of, Allah said, don't say. Right? فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا Offend. So then what do I say? Sami'na wa ata'na. Whatever you want. You know, I don't worry about it. Done. You know, I love the Kuwaiti brothers and sisters. When the, when the father or, you know, someone older than you tells you do this, what's the answer? It happened already. Sar. They call sar. Sar. Sara in Arabic means something happened in the past. Taib. Yuba wallah jibli a glass my sar it happened then they get up and get the father of a club of water the father asked for a cup of water what's the answer it happened not i will do it la 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 it happened already <laughs> look at the beauty of the language that's so beautiful you know the kuwaiti brothers and sisters i love the way they talk mashallah um, and their where their language is musical too and then they have an old Arabic accent in which they turn the jim into ya. So rijjal becomes riyal. The uh, jaja becomes diyaya. So it's a very unique accent. Them and southern uh, Iraq, they speak this jim turns into ya. So it's very nice. Uh, and they're polite people too, mashallah. So, fala taqul lahuma uffin. The second one, وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا An nahr meaning you, it's, it's screaming, but also the sudden screaming. Like you're talking, throw the garbage. No, I don't want a garbage. No, 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 no. I'm, you're bothering me. I don't want to, I'm tired. I don't want to. And then suddenly you go, ah, ah, ah. this is nahr. Nahr is like the word nahr, like a, uh, river it, you know it's like you imagine you're sitting down and suddenly there is a river hitting you at once right don't rush against them in disobedience and in screaming uh, like to a point where the child goes the father you know is uh, suddenly rattled by your screaming you know or the mother so do not scream at your parents no matter what. So someone says, uh, I was sitting down with a very beautiful boy 
and he sat in front of me and cried and cried and cried. He said, since I was at the, in dynamic, my mom screams at me. Then the way dynamic works, then I scream back. Then she screamed more and then scream back. And, and I am so tired. And I, my mom is back home. I, she, she's the reason why I'm in America. She raised me single-handedly. I am in the, one of the best universities in America because of my mom. I love my mom. She's my role model. But we have this dynamic. She starts screaming and I start screaming. What do I do? I hate it. I hate it. I said, Halas, you're an adult right now. She screams, you smile. <laughs> it's the new method. What are you trying? What are, you, are you trying to teach your mom a lesson? No. Are you trying, do you think when you scream back, Allah, she's going to change her mind? No. But are you think when you scream, she's going to get scared of you and now she'll listen? Of course not. So what are we trying to accomplish here? I'll tell you. What we're accomplishing is your nafs is so aziza to you that you cannot even take your mother screaming at you. We go back. وَاخْفِضْ لَهُمَا جَنَاحَ الذُّلِّ مِنَ الرَّحْمِينَ الذُّلِّ Humility. Yeah, you let your mother scream at you. You are, mashallah, 26 years old. Nothing is going to happen to you if your mother screams at you. And he said, you're absolutely right. I said, forget everything. You have only one homework. You're going to meet me after one week to 10 days, and you're going to tell me the last phone call, two or three phone calls my, with my mom overseas. I did not scream. خلاص. Only one homework. Don't overwhelm yourself. He said, okay, so I'm still waiting to meet him again and get the feedback. It's just one thing. Just don't scream back. And they love each other. Like there's no love lost, right? But this dynamic, it hurts him. And, and you know, when you get older, now you're creative with your words. So now he's not only screaming, he's using words that hurts more. So he doesn't want to do that. Okay, then don't scream. And don't insult. She's screaming. Okay, let her scream. It's okay. You know, I'll teach you this technique and you can use it in your marriage and you can use it with your children. Okay. Do you know we human beings are very funny? As if there is not enough drama in our lives, we go and watch drama. <laughs> Pakistani drama, soap operas, Indian dramas, Egyptian dramas, Syrian dramas, you know, these countries are very good production, you know. They have uh, recently, mashallah, in Morocco, now they have also like their episode series, right? Drama. And people are watching and family conflict and they're screaming at each other and then they're crying. And, they're, and you, you don't need to just watch your life and you have the biggest drama. You're doing the same thing in reality. You don't need to watch that. Just watch your life. Okay. But then this is what, this is the wisdom that you need to learn. It's interesting that when in the episode, when the plot is happening, and now, I don't know, the husband and wife misunderstood each other. So he's screaming, she's screaming, and now the drama. You're like, now, man, this is getting good. Ah, oh, Masha, this is, let's watch, let's watch. And the more they scream, the more like, man, this is, this is, no, the director and the writer, like they did their plot, right? Now I'm enjoying this now. Okay, man. And then at the end you discover it was all misunderstanding. But in the beginning, they will not show you that it's a misunderstanding. It, it, like he uh, heard her talking about him or she, something like that. So when they scream or they cry, you actually, because what happened, you have detached yourself from the screen and you know this is something to watch and enjoy, you're actually watching and enjoying. So if the husband and wife are good people, and they actually don't like screaming at each other, but they still do scream at each other, what's the technique that you need to apply? Start watching, stop getting involved. The husband is screaming, huh? Yeah, man, this is getting good. No, let's watch. <laughs> Let's enjoy. The wife is screaming. The husband, man, this is like episode number 30 now. We're getting into like the thick of the, the whole thing was introduction. Now it's the real meat, the bread beef, right? Let me watch. Your parents are screaming. Watch. Don't get involved. Don't become part of the conversation. Use the technique of watching because we literally pay money 
to go to the movie theater to watch someone screaming at someone and someone beating someone and someone crying because of someone. We pay money for that. You're getting it for free at home. Enjoy it. <laughs> you understand? Enjoy it. Enjoy it. You cannot be serious about everything in life. You know where I learned this, all of this? You think I'm smart. I didn't learn. I learned this from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They want me to tell you a story. Wallahi, when I read it the first time, I didn't believe it. Yani, I didn't believe it in a positive sense, meaning when you say this is unbelievable. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in the house of Aisha. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was all brains. She was not good with cooking. She was not good with cleaning. She was not good with house chores, even though she did her best. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ended up with a, a guest in her house. And in the house of Aisha, that day, zero food, which is a common scene, gharib. Yani the Prophet وسلم, will wake up in the morning, give sadaqat, and then by the time of lunch, oh my God, we forgot, we don't have anything to eat. Dinner with zero, 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 nothing in the fridge, nothing in the food pantry, nothing, nothing, nothing. So the guest is walking in. So the other wife of the Prophet وسلم, she's like, wallah, this is embarrassing. The Prophet وسلم, has this guest. And the guest kind of hinted that he's hungry. So she has cooked and prepared something. So she sent the plate of food to, with the servant to the house of Aisha. He walks in and Aisha anha, smacks the plate and said, you think I don't know how to cook? You don't think I know this? And the food flew all over the place. In front of the guest, in his house, food! They don't have food. The Prophet ﷺ realized she's acting out of being a woman at this point. Like, you know, just, this is like, hey, I don't know how to cook. Like, well, this is insulting. What was his answer? He smiled and he said, Ghadibat ummukum. Your mother became angry. And he smiled and brushed it off. What is this? <laughs> He said, غضبت أمكم Your mother, because she's the mother of the believers. Yeah, your mother became angry. خلاص, let it go. <laughs> I can see why it, like it could be insulting. طب, يعني, what is this? And if, it, if this happens in any of our houses, World War III, end of the relationship. Divorce, talaq, talaq, talaq. Like what you insulted me in front of my this, in front of my guests in the house. We don't have food. You spilled food. This is the ni'mah of Allah. You throw it. Ah. Khutbah al jumaa There will be right there. Good subject for all khutbah, right? <laughs> so the idea here is the idea of watching. Deploy this with your children. I am sometimes surprised at myself and at parents that the kid does something and you really get angry. Like, are you serious? You, you're a parent. I, I even ask myself, like, are you serious? why did I get angry though? It shouldn't have bothered me. What did the kid do? Did haram being committed? No. Makruh being committed? No. Was I insulted? No. I don't know the kid, I don't know, spilled something. And you get worked out because you had a long day. You can't be serious in life about everything and you cannot be right every time and you should not stop at every mistake let it go man like let it go this is a child until they become adult and then let it go you know you know sometimes you want to say your child goes overboard you say you know what you hurt my feelings and you walk to your room no screaming back no yelling back no calling names no this you hurt my feelings and you walk back this rises the standards of the house the ethics of the house will rise that, oh my God, I hurt my mom's feeling. I hurt my dad's feeling. Oh my God, that is miserable. And they didn't answer and they didn't scream back at me. And oh my God, you feel so bad because mashallah, your kids are good kids. Like, because you're good people. There's no criminals here, right? There's no child molesters. Well, Muslims are good people in general. So what did your kid do? Your kids are good like you. Alhamdulillah. So don't be worked out on every small thing. That's another thing. So, فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفٍ وَلَا تَنْهَرُمَا And remember, 
Allah is not talking to you to say that to your child. Allah is talking to your child directly and talking to you directly. There is nowhere in the Quran, say this to your child. No, no, no. Allah is talking to the child directly. In, remember this background, how Quran approached the parenting? There is nowhere in the Quran, this is what the parent says to the child. Everywhere in the Quran, bottom up, what the child should do towards the parents. So Allah is saying, do not scream at your parents. فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا The third, فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا Do not obey them, which I keep on mentioning. And in this case, I'm mentioning, I'm mentioning فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا Even literally it means do not obey them when they ask you to do shirk, do, when they ask you to do kufr, or when they ask you to do disobedience, ma'asiyah. Deny God's existence, worship other gods with Allah, or commit a sin, you disobey them. Which means, in everything else you obey them. Which I take this command to also mean فَلَا تَعْصِهِمَا yeah, Do not disobey your parents. So one, فَلَا تَقُلْ لَهُمَا أُفِّن Two, وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا Two, وَلَا تَعْصِهِمَا hmm? يعني, Do not disobey them. Which is in the Quran, فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا Number four, <coughs> the word that Allah used with Yahya alayhi salam wa barran bi walidayhi wa lam yakun jabbaran asiyya awwal wahda wa shaqiyya thani wahda I think yes one second Yahya asiyya wa lam yakun jabbaran wa lam yakun jabbaran asiyya wa shaqiyya awwal wahda I think okay because they, they both ayat sound the same uh, so, Surah Maryam. Asiyah. Yes. Shaqiyah. Tamam. Jabbar. Do not be Jabbar with your parents. Jabbar is one of the names of Allah. Tyrant. But in the name of Allah Azza wa Jal, it means, Jabbar means, can strike at anyone at any moment. Can strike at anyone at any moment. So Allah is Al-Jabbar is one of Asma'ul Jalal, Al-Muntaqim, the Avenger. Hmm. These are the names of Al-Jalal. Allah is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, the names of Al-Jamal, the names of beauty. But then there is the name of might, Al-Aziz, Al-Jabbar, Al-Mutakabbir. These are names that can only be used with Allah. Allah can strike at anyone at any time, stop anyone at any time, has the absolute might and power. Type. What happens when I start acting, and obviously Allah is Al-Jabbar, but also Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, but also Al-Adil, but also fair and just and this. So he's a Jabbar, but he uses the name of Al-Jabbar with the other names. We are not God, obviously. So Allah said, don't be Jabbar, tyrant striking back you know so do not be a tyrant with your parents be a tyrant do not be a tyrant with it be a tyrant with a tyrant outside the house but be a tyrant with your parents that is and this is something that I see and exists in the world in which the child becomes like a curse and a source of uh, uh, pain and suffering to the parents because he's attacking. You know, there's a difference that I see, uh, I was dealing with a case, <clears throat> the child get, comes home, goes into the room and closes the door. Never disrespects the mom or the dad, never says any bad word, but he's heartbroken over his childhood, whatever happens and blaming the parents, but he doesn't scream, he doesn't beat, he doesn't yell. He, they ask him for anything, he will do it. But he's refraining from being nice and you know, good child. He's refraining from that. So I told the father and the mother, Alhamdulillah, your child, you have to see the blessings. In it. Your child just goes in and locks the room. He doesn't wanna talk to you, but you ask him for anything he does, right? They said, right, including throwing the garbage out. 
including all the things. So we cannot consider one level of disobedience, like your child is hurt with another level of disobedience. Jabbar is the kid is giving pain and stuff actively. The kid is screaming, yelling, pushing, could be even beating his parents. Huh? He could be even beating his parents. So what, at the khilaf of Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab, he saw a person being rude and to his father and he said, why are you doing this? He said, I saw him doing this to his father. He said, A'udhu Billah, don't ever do that again. And he taught him a lesson and he stopped it and he reconciled between the father and the son. So the idea here is what? Um, uh, جبارن, and then the next word is Asiya. Asiya is frequently disobedient. Min Masiya. So when someone disobeys and disobeys and disobeys and disobeys, yeah, can, can you actually every 10 obedience, maybe you disobey once? Yeah, and it's something we can swallow, humanly possible. But asiya, 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 yeah, this is a problem. So Allah said, do not be asiya. And the other one is shaqiya. So Jabbar and Asiya and Jabbar and Shaqiya with Sayyidina Yahya, Jabbar and Asiya with Sayyidina Ismail, Shaqiya. Shaqi is the one that causes heartache to the parents. Shaqa. You make the life of your parents miserable. You make the life of your parents miserable. Na'udhu Billah. So this is something that we have to uh, pay attention. So let's go again. Fala taqul lahuma uffin. Number two. وَلَا تَنْهَرْهُمَا Right? And number three, فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا يعني here, فَلَا تَعْصِهِمَا Do not disobey them. Number four, جَبَّارًا Number five, عَصِيَّة Frequently disobedient. Number six, شَقِيَّة Let's say them in English. Number one, do not complain when they ask you for something. Number two, do not scream and yell at them. Number three, do not disobey them just like that, constantly, like, you know. Number four, do not be a tyrant with them. Number five, don't be frequently disobedient, like rebellious, right? Number six, do not make their lives miserable. Look how all of these words are general. They're all general. Because different culture, different times, different ways could be different mechanics, right? طيب. Number seven, which is mentioned in the hadith, but not in the Quran, which is al-uquq. Aq. Aq means someone who is the same world, but different color. Uquq is like, I am bent on disobeying you and dishonoring you. Like I'm basically, I'm bent on giving you hard time. I'm, get, I'm bent on causing you heartache and pain and suffering. In the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, someone who commits shirk will not enter Jannah. Three times. And the one who Practice uquq with his parents. One who practices uquq to his parents. The one who practices uquq will not enter Jannah. So this word, and from here, I want to share something with you uh, uh, to, to, to give you this understanding. You know how the word birr is the one through nine? The word uquq is one through nine here. Okay? So it's jabbar, shaqiyya, asiyya, whatever, you know, uffin, tanhar, huma, it's all in uquq. It's like different colors of uquq. Are you with me? Do you know the beautiful tradition that when you have a son or daughter born, we go and slaughter a lamb and we call it what? Do you know why? You're saying, Ya Allah, with the barakah and the blessing of this slaughtered animal, you take the uquq away from my child towards me and his mother. You understand? 
That's the meaning of aqiqa. Yani, we're going to slaughter the disobedience now. Yalla, bismillah. <laughs> we're slaughtering the disobedience right now. We're done. Ya Allah, please make this child not aq. Because again, if your child doesn't listen to you once in a while, come on, he's a human. Uh, let it go. If your child once lost his temper, he's became 13, and for the first time he screamed in his life, uh, let it go. Don't... Don't, and this is a big warning, don't say to your child, you're disobedient. You are teaching him what to say to himself, and he's going to, for the rest of his life, say, I'm a disobedience, I'm disobedient, I'm disobedient, especially if you repeat the word. Don't make your child someone that he's not, especially in the first seven years. The kid is not listening. He, you're disobedient. You give me a hard time. He's going to grow up thinking I'm disobedient. You don't have to state it in words. If he's disobedient, say, Allah yirda alayk, listen to me. Allah yirda alayk, may Allah be pleased with you. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Don't tell him, you are not listening to me. What are you trying to build a, now a self-image? MashaAllah, my mom, well, I always said, I don't listen, so I'm proud of it. And what, you want to say, my mom said, I love you. My mom said, you're the source of my happiness. Remember relationships? You're the source of my joy. It was the brightest day in my life, even though it wasn't. When you and I, when Allah gave me you, for example, <laughs> say something, be nice, establish a good relationship, right? Now, here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us to not have uquq to our parents. So we slaughter the lamb with the intention, with the dua that Allah will take uquq. Here is something that they attack us Muslims, the non-Muslims, they attack our children. I found that from Muslim kids in, in Hayward High School. Look at the attack that they got from another high school kid that goes to church and trained to attack our kids. There's a lot of them specifically in Hayward because the largest concentration of Muslim Afghans is in Fremont and Hayward. What is saying? Look, discrimination in the, boy, in the bones in Islam. Why? You know in your deen, the sunnah of your prophet, when you get a boy, you slaughter two lambs. And when you get a girl, you slaughter only one. It's in your DNA. It's in your blood. What kind of a deen? I say, wallahi, that's true. It's discrimination. Sarah. Because 99%, the hard time comes from the boy. We need two lambs. Ya Allah, please. The first one didn't work. The second one, Ya Allah, please. Ya Allah, two, three, three. A girl, you can slaughter a chicken, no problem. It's enough. There's no uquq. The uquq doesn't come usually from the girls. In general, and every rule has an exception. So for a girl, one, so it's actually discrimination against the boy. Yalla, go figure that out. Because people don't know their deen, they don't know what's the meaning of the word aqiqa. And this girl came to me distressed and said, is that true? Because I didn't know that about our deen. I said, oh, it's true. And I'm very proud of it. And she's now, her blood is boiling. I said, let me explain to you why two for the boy and one for the girl. Because of this. And she smiled and she laughed. And she said, oh my God, I like that. Oh, that's a good joke. It turned from a, a doubt in the deen to a joke. So this is very, very important that we... Um, uh, know that Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned in the Quran in general um, another word in the Quran is uh, Allah said don't do that with your kids nor the kids should do that with the parents you know how we learned that the Arab used to slot, bury their daughters after birth in fear of shame but people don't read that in the Quran, Allah mentioned twice that people used to bury their sons after birth, like the daughters, in fear of poverty. So the Arab did not know, the people in the past did not know how to have abortion. They try, they try. We have in the records that people, that women would make another woman stand on her in hope that the child will come out early but it doesn't work like Allah created the womb to take all the subhanallah so the idea they used to try to do abortion but but so they have to wait for the child to be born and then they will either bury the child because she's a girl and fear of shame or boy or a girl not because of shame because the family is large 
and I don't have enough time, enough uh, wealth to feed them. So there's two ayat in the Quran. وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ خَشْيَةَ إِمْلَاقٍ نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُكُمْ وَإِيَّاهُمْ or نَحْنُ نَرْزُقُهُمْ وَإِيَّاكُمْ So Allah wanted to emphasize the meaning, do not kill your boys and your children in fear of poverty. I will give you your sustenance and I'll give them their sustenance. Another ayah, it starts with, I'll give them their sustenance, and I'll give you your sustenance. So one time Allah put the father before the child, and one time put the, the child before the parents. Parents before child, linguistically to show, I'll give you rizq, and I'll give the child, and I'll give the child, and I'll give you, the, I don't know what you're trying, why you're killing your baby. Are you worried about you? Because some parents say, I don't want my child to go through misery of being poor, so I'm giving, give, giving him a rest from life. I'm doing him a favor. La, Allah said, if you're doing him a favor, I'll give him rizq. If you're doing yourself a favor, I'm giving you rizq. So relax. You know, don't do this. This is, wala taqtulu. Do not kill your children. So this, Allah tells us with our children and with our parents not to be bakhil, bukhala, which means miserly and stingy, meaning we don't spend, we don't give, we don't this, because you know this this bukhul, it's a sickness. It's literally a psychological sickness that if it takes over you, it will ruin your life. Like you don't want to spend, you don't want to spend, you don't want to spend. What, what, what are you saving money for if you're not going to use some of that money? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the Quran give us a, a mental uh, image. You know how we have uh, slides with, with uh, diagrams to explain? One of the ways of teaching the Quran is Allah give you mental diagram image. So he said, وَلَا تَجْعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً إِلَىٰ عُنُوقِكَ this is an image, which means don't make your, you don't be so stingy that your hand, you're so afraid to spend your like this. You know, you know yani my money is as dear to me as my life. Because where do you slaughter someone? Here. My money is as dear to me. Kill me, but don't take my money. <laughs> you understand? وَلَا تَبْسُطْهَا كُلَّ البسط. And don't stretch your hand all over like, when you do كُلَّ البسط, يعني which means if there is any money here, it all fell off, which is extravagant way of life, overspending. وَلَا تَجْعَلْ يَدَكَ مَغْلُولَةً إِلَىٰ عُنُقِكْ وَلَا تَبْسُطْهَا كُلَّ الْبَسْطِ وَابْتَغِي بَيْنَ ذَلِكَ سَبِيلًا And figure out the middle ground between that. Not stingy and not overspending. And in this, I would like to share something with you. A very common mistake that we pay the price of when we try to protect our children from something they should not be protected from. We come from back home, we come from back home and we had a hard childhood. We didn't have toys, we didn't have, I remember we were, we were allowed uh, one shoe a year. My father will buy for every child one shoe. That's your Eid shoe, that's your soccer shoe, that's your school shoe, that's your, that's one shoes. One shoes a year. My foot grew, it's not my problem. Next year, we'll buy you a shoes. Tell your foot to stop. Your, your fingers can come out of the shoes, no problem. You will have a holy shoes, you know, has a hole in it, right? So the idea here, what I have seen many parents do is I oh, I, I want to give everything to my child. I don't want them to experience what I went through. You have just stolen the love of struggle and the love of growing and the love of having from your child. So listen to this after thinking so much about this topic because I saw it affecting so many homes. So this is a rule in life. I came up with this statement. If you grow up having nothing, you would want everything. So, mashallah, look at you. You went to college and university and came to America and learned good English and got a job, then a better job, then a higher position, then opened your business, then you have this and you come a startup and you have saving and you have a home and you have a car. Where, where we look at you and your child, one piece of bread eating, dry piece of bread, nothing. Now, 
doctor says stop eating meat your cholesterol is hitting the high and you used to eat meat once every Eid al-Abha what happened? Okay. do you know when you have nothing you want everything when you have everything you want nothing you want nothing what I have seen is we have given our children so much and anything they ask for, we give it to them. Oh, why shall I study hard? Why shall I go to the university? Why shall I become something? Why do everything I need, I want is there? Yeah, let your kids wish something. Learn how to say no. It's not good to say yes just because you can afford it. Let your kids struggle. Yeah. Oh, Daddy, can I buy another shoes? Let's open. One, two, three. Dressy shoes, daily walking shoes, sports shoes. Why at number four? Can you why? No, we're not buying another one. Let them want something. Let them just let every toy they ask for it, they get. Everything they wish they get. You stole you stole their wind from them. If you look at all of these big guys that became rich, including yourself, you all came from poor background. What's our problem today with our kids? I want to be a YouTuber. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. I want to become an influencer. Influ in what? I don't know, but I want to be an influencer. Yeah, I'm not sure even what I want to influence people to do. Just the job title sounds good. Another one. I want to be a content creator. Allah, 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 Allah. What content, MashaAllah? What? Fishing, what? Hunting, what? What? I don't know, but I want to be a content creator. Sounds good to me. I want to be a rapper. There's 350 million people in the United States. Do you the name? Do you know the name of 35 rappers? If you're lucky, maybe you know the name of one or none, especially for our generation. But for our kids, they can name for you 10 rappers. It's not even one, 350 million, it's not even one in 10 million <laughs> ratio of success. I want to become Michael Jordan. Hell. And the problem is they don't follow through. Like, I don't have a problem if the kid is really good with basketball and he wants to, no, no problem, that, he's good with it. But the problem, he doesn't even, he's not even getting up to get the training, but I want to become Michael Jordan. So, yeah. How, how? Where did all of this come from? This is the sickness of the rich people and which we are all in America rich because you gave your child everything they asked for. Don't do that. So on one side, don't be miserly. On every side, don't give everything because you'll steal their wind. Let them wish, when I grow up, I'm going to buy the car that I want. Okay, now there is some motivator, dunya motivator. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to work so hard, and I'm going to buy that car that I want, and my father didn't buy it to me. Okay, good. It's not my job to buy you your dream car. It's, I, my job is to get you a car from point A and to point B. What do you want after that? Go and do it yourself. So then the kid has some motivation in life. I'm seeing an epidemic and a pandemic of kids who want to do nothing. We suffered and pain and came to America in the Silicon Valley. Apple is across the street. Ah, I'm not interested. I don't want to learn computer science. What do you want to learn? A graphic design. Type. Can you study graphic design very well? No. I'm tired. What do you, what do you want to do in life? Because everything is available. Don't do that. So now we have, that's item number eight. Um, so, uh, there was two Sahabis, father and son, and the son was complaining that the father was taking his money away, like he will make money and he will take it and use it. So he complained to the Prophet wasallam. He told him, Anta wa maluka li abik. You and your money all belongs to your father. So the idea here, do not be stingy. 
Do not be stingy. That goes with a daughter with her mother, the daughter with her father, the daughter, you know. Um, so these are eight don'ts. I have another two, but I will not mention them because they are in the general context. In Allah la yuhibbu kulla mukhtalin fakhur. Don't be arrogant with your parents, right? And don't have an attitude. Wala tusa'ir khaddaka nas. Don't have an attitude with your parents. It's not necessarily that you're saying no, but you keep talking to them. You know, I don't want to do that. I don't know. Leave me alone. Yeah. This is the idea of when I raise my cheek up like that, that I'm being arrogant and I have an attitude. I'm like have a big ego with the parents. So the other two, don't have an attitude. Uh, number 10, don't be arrogant. So number one, don't say off, complain to them. Number two, wala tanharhuma, do not scream at them. Number three, fala ta'asihima, which is mentioned, fala tuti'huma, do not disobey them. Number four, jabbaran. Number five, asiyya. Number six, shaqiyya. Number seven, al-uquq an al-aq. Number eight, do not be stingy with them. Number nine, do not act with pride with your parents. And number 10, don't have an attitude. These 10 don'ts mentioned in the Quran and in the Hadith, right? So I would like to um, stop here because the rest is more detailed techniques. Um, but I believe it's, um, you know, there is a whole... Um, other list that needs explanation. Um, do not blame. Talk about the solution. Do not compare your kids with their brothers and sisters or with other kids. Tell them what you want from them. You want to talk about others? then don't talk in comparison. Just talk about the others alone. Wallahi, this, this brother, you're, you know, this kid, I came to hear this kid, man, he finished school and he's already working. The kid will get it that you're telling him that. But don't tell him, why you're not like your friend, he finished his school and he went working. Don't talk as a comparison. State what you want. State the example, but don't say, compare him explicitly right don't blame them don't compare them don't make fun of them don't make fun of your kids seriously making fun of them i see parents do that like look you're a loser <laughs> you don't know how to do anything literally they talk to their parents like that um, do not call them names uh, do not uh, uh, do not call them names do not use violence with them. Do not uh, generalize. They didn't do their homework. You always don't do your homework. Okay, let's see. Why, why generalization? They got in A, 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 B, C. What kind of a child you have a C? You never study. You never do always playing. You never. Yeah. This is generalization. Okay, he got one C. Maybe the guy has actually a problem with that topic. Maybe he was sick. Maybe he missed an exam. Maybe you don't understand. But we love to generalize with our kids, which is not fair, right? So don't generalize. Uh, the big one, when you don't listen to them, they come to vent out to you. You're not interested. Oh, you know, today, I think I was bullied. Like this, this kid, like he's telling you about bullying and you're not listening. Because you think your relationship with your child is you speak, they listen, you tell them what to do and what not to do, and it ends there. Sometimes the kid is about to explode from how much pressure they're facing at school, right? Uh, so do, do not ignore them, meaning listen to them. Do not scream. Obviously, this we already mentioned it. Uh, two things. Do not over love you know the love that makes you like so attached and then your kid 
you know, okay, can I go and be with my friends? No, I love you. I want to hang out. Can you leave the kid? Too much love is not good. And the other one, which is too much attachment, and the other one, don't be overprotective, the hovering parents. Let you, the, your kids make the mistakes under your eyes. Don't be a hovering parent. Whatever, they make mistakes, they say, yeah, sometimes look the other way. Let them this, but in certain things the mother should deal with. The father knows, but he will not talk. Because the child trusted the mother. Sometimes the child trusts the father and he doesn't want to tell. You can tell, but don't blow his cover. If he trusted you and told you, don't tell another person, make sure you don't tell the other person or you tell the other person never ever to bring it up because then they will not trust you again. So don't expose them, right? So don't expose them. And you know the most embarrassing thing when you expose the child. Or you try to raise your kid in front of his friends. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. Don't try to raise your child in front of his kids to embarrass them. That's another big don't. Uh, do not overprotect. Let them make mistakes as long as the mistakes are within the halal world. I'm not talking let them go mistakes, drink alcohol, use drugs, commit haram, go gambling, uh, go to a club. Uh, we're not talking about that. We're talking about mistakes within the home, within the halal world. We're not talking about mistakes. Because if your kid, as I said yesterday, if your kid is in public school, may Allah help you, and I don't know how you go to sleep, but maybe some of you have figured it out. I've never figured it out, and I don't want to figure it out. And I will never risk any of my children to be brainwashed day in, day out, day in, day out. I don't, you know, we barely spend time with our children, and they're spending eight hours in school, all of the talk, all of the talk, all of the talk that is 100% against our faith, our tradition, our culture, our norms. It's 100% against it. They're talking, talking, talking. And then you expect your child to be no one, right? To not be affected by all of that. I will not experiment with my child. Uh, Sheikh Yusuf Estes uh, said something, which he, he's definitely direct, uh, you know, uh, that I cannot uh, talk like him, but he he was talking in one of his videos that if if you're okay in putting your child in a toilet and flushing him down the toilet, then you should be okay sending him to where he doesn't belong, because that's flushing him to the drains, to the sewage of the society. That's Sheikh Yusuf Estes. He's he's definitely direct and and very harsh with his words, but I have seen. Uh, the pain and suffering again and again and again. Finally, I want to say something to you. It's in your blind spot, and I don't think anyone ever prepared us for that. Alhamdulillah, yesterday someone asked me, said, I have a 12 years old. Okay, I want you to understand something. We human beings completely evolve to a different human from age 13 and up. So if you are building that your kid goes to public school, or go, does what? And he's the most loving, caring, da 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 kid. And you, that's what you're building your security on. Then you have absolutely no idea what's going on in this world. Especially if your kid is going to public school. Age 12 is the last year your kid should be in that school. And then you should pull them out. Why? Because the kid himself will not know what hit him after he hits puberty and 13 and he goes to high school. It's not possible that he can keep it together. I'll tell you something, and you will laugh at this. I dare you and challenge you, not, don't go to the same school that your kid goes to high school. Find another high school, and you go and volunteer in that school, in a high school. After two weeks, you're going to come home acting like a teenager. <laughs> you, you, the parent. You're going to come back acting. And your child will be like, come on, stop acting like a teenager. That's me. That's not you. The environment is so powerful, especially high schools. It's the most dangerous experience within the American experience, high school. American parents who don't have halal and haram, who don't believe in God, an atheist, are pulling their hair when their kids go to public school, high school. 
it's not possible to keep it together. In my judgment, it's not. For some kids, they know how to keep it together. For some families, they know how to keep it together. I think these families are one in a million and one in, in, in half a million. So I will never take that risk with my child. Please, 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 I beg you, you have to be ready that your beautiful, amazing, smooth, soft, nice, kind child, when they hit 13, they're going to evolve to another species, another human. If they, when they evolve to this new stage in life, if they're not in a good environment and they have good friends and you've done your homework from age 1 to 12, only Allah will know what you're going to go through. But this is a daily, daily heartbreak for me. Ya Sheikh, my kid, she was the best girl. She was, the, she was, uh, she was unbelievable. Sheikh, I'm telling you, you don't understand. She was the nicest. She, uh, all the other parents used to compare their daughters with my daughter. Sheikh, you don't understand. I cannot believe it. I'm gonna die. This is different. She, can, she doesn't talk to me. She doesn't. She yells at me, screams at me, leave me alone, shuts the door in my face. Please, Sheikh, I'm dying. I don't know what to do. Because you did not expect this to happen. I am telling you right now, expect this to happen when your kids hit 13 and they start going to high school. Right now, it's even starting earlier at age 11, 12, because middle school is becoming like a high school. So, but please, do, the thing is like in your head, you're saying, no, 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 I raised this kid very well. Okay, no, I raised him. I know my kids. I, please, you don't know your kids. You, it has nothing to do with you or your kid or the way you raise your kid. That kid, if you put him in high school with that pressure, with that way of thinking, preached and to him every day, and especially if he's in public school from age 1 to 12, he's not going to know what hit him. He doesn't know what happened. You will not know what happened. That's just how life is. Brothers and sisters, if I, if I have a wish, if Allah tells me, Give me one wish in dunya that you want me to grant you. This will be my wish, to tell the parents that when I tell them this lamb you have that is going to turn into a wolf, that when I say that to them, that they will believe me. Nobody believes me. And everybody ends up in my office doing counseling exactly for what I told them. There's no playing with kids age 13 and above. The society will wash them and throw them and chew them and spit them like you've never seen before. And it will not be your fault, I repeat, especially if you did a good job raising them. It will not be their fault, I repeat, because it will be, they don't know what hit them when the hormones had happened and when the society pressures them. And when the, by the time they wake up many times, we have already buried them in five pillars farm. They've already killed themselves either through drugs, alcohol, gangs, blah, 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 blah. I buried 18 years old in five pillars, shot in the head. I just visited someone. It was a miracle that he's still alive. His friend walked in because he was in the wrong environment with the wrong people because of public school. So his high school friend, he took money from him. He didn't return it. He walked at his apartment in the shower and shot him three times. He should be dead. But subhanAllah, he got paralyzed from the neck down and he will never walk again in his life. What? 27 years old. This stuff goes ugly so fast, so bad, you don't understand. And the 18 years old, three mashayikh in the Bay Area, they say this was the best kid in the masjid. The parent took him to masjid every day, took him to the masjid every day, took him to the masjid. Khalas, he hit high school, it's attractive. Whatever movies he watched, he want to apply it right now. He wants to be James Bond. Shot, we went and buried him. The best two parents, the whole community bears witness that this is one of the best families in our community. So it's not their fault. And it's not the kid's fault. It's American public school and American culture fault, and the kid, the kid is dead.
So I don't know how to explain it to you more than this, but please, please listen to me. You have to prepare yourself psychologically. That child between 1 and 12 is different than completely different species. Like literally, a lamb evolves into a wolf. Yes. So do you want him to be a good wolf, a good lion, or a bad lion? That's up to you. You don't throw them in that era. You take them out. You put them in a good environment. Swimming, archery, horseback riding, soccer, basketball, you name it. You kill, suck their energy out with the uh, uh, sports and stuff like that. If you can't, you can do Islamic school. If you can't, you can do homeschool. If you can't, send them to college early. And the beauty of sending them to college while they're minors, they will not be influenced. There is no high school culture in college. Nobody knows nobody in college. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Do you know what? I do counseling for American kids. Do you know what's the most common statement? How stupid I was. I thought the whole world runs like a high school. The biggest shock of my life is when I went to college. It turned, I discovered I was living in an alternative universe. It's a whole other universe. It's the most stupid thing. This is American kids talking to me who are not Muslim. College, nobody gets lost in college. And if you took your kid while he was 15, 16, 17, 18 to college, anyone cannot talk to them because they're minor. So no one can become the boyfriend of your girl because he will go to jail because she's a minor. So your kid will go to school and no, everybody will be scared to talk to them. So they'll go to school, they will learn, they will not interact with anyone that you don't want. They will go and find their Muslim friends in the school. Everyone else will be like, uh, how old did you say you are? 15, okay, I'm going away, bye-bye, have a nice, nice to meet you, bye-bye. Will, nobody will do this, you know? So this is something I'm teaching you from experience. The best thing you can do to your child, let them finish the four years in high, of high school in one year, take the CHASPI exam, take the high school, California high school diploma, go straight to college, they will not get lost to college because no one can talk to them. And if someone talks to them, you pick up the phone call and the police will come and arrest them. It's heaven, like nobody can, no one can touch your kid. For you as a parent, Muslim parent, that's the best. So you solve all problems and your kid graduate early and become smart and finish early and get ahead in life. And now maybe, especially if your daughter, what, 18, 19, 20, well, she want to consider marriage, let her get married. She's done with her schooling, class, university finished. When everybody's still grinding at it, you know? So this is, these are practical tips that I wanted to share with you instead of only theoretical. You know, did the food arrive, inshallah? Jazakumullah khair. Any, so I will end with the one question from the brothers, one question from the sisters. Okay, that's good. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa al-Asr, inna l-insana la fi khusr, ila al-ladhina amanu wa amilu salihat wa tawasaw bil-haq wa tawasaw bil-sabr. Jazakumullah khair. More stuff will be, Jazakumullah khair, MCC for inviting me. More stuff is on also our website, uh, tawasaw.org. Uh, mashallah, this has been live streamed on MCC live stream, and our Tawasaw crowd is watching, actually, while uh, this. I was told that uh, a lot more people would have came, but because uh, Thanksgiving week, but it was the only weekend that I had open for the next two, three months, so alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Inshallah, we see you again. And uh, Jazakallah Khair, Brother Zahir, you should say thank you to this man. He's been chasing me for one year, and finally I'm back after three, four years of being in MCC. Such a pleasure, such a beautiful masjid, beautiful community, amazing brothers and sisters. If I said anything that hurt your feelings, I didn't mean that. But I'd rather make you cry today and laugh tomorrow than make you laugh today and cry tomorrow, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.